Let me know when you're ready, Mandy. Okay, very good, thank you. Thanks for your patience, everyone. And welcome to the May, can't believe it, 17th, 2022 meeting of the San Luis Coastal Unified School District Board of Trustees. At this time, we'd like to ask those in attendance who primarily are on Zoom to please keep your videos off or, and your audio mute unless you're presenting information or speaking in public comment. We're offering translation services for our Spanish speaking attendees. To access translation, please click on the globe at the bottom of your screen and then the language. At this time, we'd like to ask if anyone who might need translation would please click on the participants icon at the bottom of your screen and raise your hand. Buenas tardes y bienvenidos. Esta junta va a tener interpretación al español, pero necesitamos saber si necesita nuestros servicios, así que les voy a pedir que levanten su mano um, utilizando la carita sonriente en la barra que dice reacciones y si necesitan los servicios van a estar entonces ya establecidos, solamente tienen que poner uh, después el globito y dar uh, español. Thank you. So the board did meet in closed session. We talked about three things. First was anticipated litigation, significant exposure to potential litigation, one case. Personnel, uh, we reviewed and uh, took possible action on employment, dismissal or discipline of district employees. And our conference with our labor negotiators uh, regarding um, San Luis Coastal Unified School, I'm sorry, San Luis Teachers Association, MEC, CSEA, SEIU, and SLCTA. Do we have a consensus on the order of business? Everybody good? And I do wanna say that uh, Dr. Eisendrath Rogers was not feeling well. We're hope, hoping that she will join us via Zoom this evening. Uh, Mrs. Sheffer is joining us with Zoom this evening. Um, she is in Montana with her granddaughter and her daughter and her new grandson. So she will be joining us there. Mr. Buckman will be acting as clerk for us this evening. Let's go on, let's move right on to 6.01, student representatives to the board. So do we have anybody here actually in, anybody here in, in present? Yeah. Ah. ah, come on down. <laughs> there he is, yay. Hard. Okay, I'm just gonna share my screen really quickly. Hello, I'm Grace Bide. I'm the ASB for Slow High School's Vice President, and this is Atticus Fenton. He's going to be our next year's president. Hey, everybody. Welcome. Uh, happy to be here. Uh, really excited, ready to learn for next year. So uh, thanks for having me. Okay, I'm just going to go over a few things that we're doing to wrap up our school year. So starting off, our track team won CIF last week, and this was the first time that our boys team has ever took championship and the first time that the girls have won since 2009. So that was really exciting that they both got a win at the same time. And then we have a group of members moving on to masters this Saturday, which is really exciting. So we're wishing them good luck. And then our students just finished AP testing these past two weeks. We had 24 total exams taken and we're very excited to be done with that. We're holding our prom this weekend at the Fremont. It's from eight to 1030 and the theme is old Hollywood. So we're all really excited for that. It's the first time we've ever had it at the Fremont. So we're hoping everything goes well and it's gonna go well. We're really excited. And also we're partnering with Luis's place and Slow Frozen Yogurt downtown to be opened after prom. So they're doing like a special Slow High prom menu and things. So it'll be really exciting. And then our powder puff is being held June 1st. We have two games playing. We have a freshman sophomore game playing first and then a junior senior game. And in between the junior senior game, we have a group of boys who are creating a dance cheerleading performance. So that'll be very exciting. Everyone's excited, we'll see that. And thank you, does anyone have any questions? Okay, thank you. No, thank you very much. Welcome aboard and 
we look forward to seeing you uh, next year. It's pretty exciting. All right. Do we have uh, Nick here? Is Nick uh, Nick doing Zoom for us? Okay, yes, Nick. I'm, I'm Zooming in. <laughs> you, <you're> just... <laughs> well, welcome aboard, Nick. Thank you. So I have quite a few things to say. Uh, Mora Bay has been pretty busy this uh, last couple of weeks. Um, May is Mental Health Awareness Month. So Ms. Brinkman's psychology students created um, a spirit week and held some super cool activities uh, last week to promote positive mental health at the high school. And then the FFA banquet was last Wednesday and that went really well. Um, and everyone, staff, family feels really lucky for Ms. Flynn's amazing efforts and leadership and um, her FFA leadership abilities. It's always been super great. And uh, we're inviting all of you board members to come see the new sheep pens. And then last week we had a student car show, which went super cool. And the Elk Senior of the Year honor was awarded to Jackson Stover and Abigail Roberts. Uh, they earned a senior of the month at some point throughout the year, and now they have the title of senior of the year, and they will get a $500 scholarship each from the Elks Club in San Luis Obispo. And then today, a local company came to our school to present about their company um, and their job opportunities there. That's called Rantec Power Systems. Um, they're a designer and manufacturer of power supplies for the military and aerospace markets. Um, They've made components for the Patriot missile and F-35 aircraft, along with many others. That sounds very complex. Uh, their job opportunities start at $18 an hour, which is super cool. And Rantec will also help pay for education with their education reimbursement program. So that's, that's super cool that um, we got to experience that opportunity. And then as far as sports go, um, baseball and softball have their playoffs this week. Uh, swim and dive CIF. Um, the girls team took fourth overall at CIF D2 in Hanford, which is super cool. And then the boys team with only seven athletes took 21st, beating out 12 other schools. Um, on the diving side, Charlie Peterson had a fifth place finish in the diving finals and Wesley Wilson placed seventh. Uh, boys tennis, we had a CIF champion, uh, Jackson Hansen. Uh, boys track and field won league for the first time since 1974, which was really cool. I got to go to the league championship for track, and that was really fun. Um, boys golf were undefeated league champions, and they won CIF title in, in Division II. Um, and then last night was our film festival. That went really well. Uh, it was a new thing that um, Mr. Mamarella and Miss Hainer put on, and it was really cool. And then tomorrow we're having a, another student recognition lunch, and that's essentially where a teacher invites two students, and there's a big lunch event, and it's just a nice lunch interaction. And then this Thursday, the spring production of Susicle the Musical is starting, and we're hopeful that all the board members receive the information and that you're able to attend if you can. The play begins at 7 p.m. Thursday, Friday, and Saturday in the quad. And we also have a band concert on Monday, May 23rd at the PAC at Cal Poly. That's at 7 p.m., and that's free for everyone. And lastly, next week, we are having our first senior recognition assembly. And that's essentially um, there to recognize accomplishments of the class of 2022. And it's a school-wide assembly, and it'll include the soon-to-be freshmen from Los Osos Middle School and Cayucas Elementary. And then after the assembly, the eighth graders will go on a tour of the school and have the opportunity to sign up for different sports and different clubs and things such as that. So thank you for listening. That was quite a lot. Thanks. Hey, Nick, did, Nick, can I ask you a question? Yes. Did you say that Wesley Wilson won, a, won one of the diving championships? Yes. Is he a, not also a wrestler for Morro Bay High he School? He's also a really good wrestler. Wow. Well, I'm impressed. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Um, do we have Lexi here from Pack Beach? No? Okay.
We'll go on to 6.02, San Luis Obispo High School program highlights. Dr. Prater. Good evening, Mr. Unger. Uh, uh, we do have uh, Roland Dickinson from San Luis Obispo High School, our new uh, principal there via Zoom. He's gonna join us via Zoom. So Mr. Dickinson, you with us? I am, can you hear me? We can. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna uh, share my screen here. All right, well, thank you all for having me. Again, I'm Roland Dickinson, and it's, it's so fun to be here with all of you this evening, um, just to give a little insight and some highlights about what we're doing here at San Luis Obispo High School. And um, there's obviously so much to share that's, that's visible and inspiring and big, because um, that's often how we do things at Slow High, but I really wanted to share some, some insight into how we're working as a staff in some deeply meaningful ways, and some of these enduring uh, focuses that we've had throughout the year. Uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit about how we are collaborating uh, each week as a staff uh, in a professional learning community model. Uh, I wanted to talk about uh, one of our enduring goals, which is to have each one of our students be known by name, strength, need, and interest by at least one of the staff members at our school. And also just a creative idea that we have for our schedule next year um, with tutorial. Um, so all of these things really tie in with this idea of shared leadership, and deep learning and creating a culture of care at our school. So the first one I'll talk about uh, this PLC model. Uh, and there, uh, one of the focuses that we've had is to talk about teacher clarity. Um, and there are three questions that we want each one of our students uh, to be able to answer each day. Uh, what am I learning? Why am I learning this? And how will I know that I've learned this? And this is something that we've talked a lot about as a staff and we're gonna continue to do this work uh, we're working with uh, Dr. McDowell moving forward, um, and we expect to see a lot of really good work that comes out of this uh, for our students. Uh, some of those questions are similar to the four key questions that guide PLC work. Uh, it's this iterative process of going through these questions each week and each day really as educators. Uh, what do we want our students to learn? How will we know our students have learned it? What will we do if our students haven't learned it yet? And what will we do once our students have learned it? Um, it's a simple process, but it leads to really deep work about uh, that's rooted in standards and the relevancy of what we teach and assessment and instruction and intervention and enrichment. And here are some pictures of our staff. Um, we have great teachers engaged in this work during our TCT time on Monday morning. And you see our teachers there working together and talking. Uh, but one thing that you see if you've been engaged in PLC work or leading PLC work is something that's really cool that's happening here. And you see student work in our, in our teachers' hands, and they're talking about evidence of student learning. This is really our first year, it's in many ways, focusing on PLCs the way we are. And having our teachers already looking at student work in this way shows the strides that we're already taking to make this part of our culture and the way we do things as a school. Uh, so this is an activity essentially where, um, and we do this multiple times, uh, where um, teachers talk about an essential standard in their class, why they want students to learn it, why it's really important. They share uh, a learning activity that they do with the class um, and student work in response. And then the group then um, looks at the activity and gives feedback on it, looks at the student work and shares ideas for feedback that they would give to the students. And then together they can plan some next steps. Um, so that's one of the things we're doing in that PLC model and it's, it's powerful work and we're looking to continue uh, that work. Um, this other goal that we have, having each student be known by name, strength, need, and interest. Obviously, um, you know, we are so privileged uh, to have such amazing students at our school. Um, those relationships that we have with them, the community that we build together uh, matter so much. Um, but we really want to make sure each student is connected. Um, and there's so many reasons educationally, um, from a social emotional perspective, that that's important. Um, and so essentially what we've done, and I'll just show just a picture of some of our students so you can see them and instead of me talking, um, is we initially did a survey with our students to see if they felt like they were known in this way. And then throughout the year, we've been surveying our staff. Um, so essentially with a spreadsheet of all of our students, and they then go through an initial next to the students that they feel like they know deeply and in that way. 
And then as we've gone um, through trimesters and then into the next trimester where students may have other teachers, we continue to go through this process um, to the point where we have a very small list of students that we're focusing on, really making sure that they are known in this way. So that's been a really powerful process for us to go through as a staff um, and, and in conversations with students too and with parents, um, they see these efforts that are being made. Um, at, at, on that previous slide, I talked about how we leverage this approach in our course registration process as well. And uh, once we have these deep relationships and know our students well, it can inform a lot of our, our practices. So one thing that we did recently as a staff is after our students did their course registration process, uh, we pulled the, the course registrations of all the students who didn't sign up for an honors or AP class. Um, and then as a staff, we went through those course registrations and then made some annotations. Um, on if a student could maybe take an honors class and they didn't sign up for one because they're ready for that challenge or an AP class, or maybe we're looking at CTE pathways and we see that, oh, they, they could take this next CTE pathway or a class in the pathway, or maybe they could use a support class. So our, our teachers went through annotated and then our counselors are now going through um, and following up with students um, to see if we can make any adjustments uh, to their schedule and one thing that we've found is little nudges in students' lives make a big difference. So a student who may not think that they were capable of something or ready for something um, suddenly now are. And then tutorial for next year. Um, so as you've noticed in the bottom of all these slides, I'm connecting it to the board priorities. Um, and when we're thinking about achievement, deep learning and support, when we're thinking about that PLC work, about the importance of high quality instruction, but also high quality intervention and enrichment. Um, we are proposing that we have a tutorial for next year. So a flexible period um, that is each Monday. Um, and it's an opportunity uh, for intervention. It's an opportunity for enrichment. Uh, it's opportunity for our students to get extra help from teachers, to be in study sessions, to make up labs, test quizzes. Um, and in order to make this happen well, uh, we're also going to do a lot of really interesting enrichment activities uh, where we'll bring in guest speakers each week, uh, where we'll have financial literacy workshops that our students can take. Uh, we'll have leadership series. Um, anyway, we can talk for a long time about this tutorial period and how it'll work, but essentially it's a flexible period each Monday uh, where intervention and enrichment can happen. Um, and with all those things, I think you see that sustained um, belief in high quality learning, um, communities that matter, and um, an ability to really help the whole range of our students have a meaningful experience. So that's some of the things that we're working on as a staff at Slow High. Um, each day is awesome, and um, we, we feel fortunate uh, to be here each day. So any questions? I think my five minutes have elapsed. Questions? <laughs> Ms. Dobler-Drew, followed by Dr. Eisendrath Rogers. Oh, oh now there, there we okay. go. Well, I just think that's a wonderful um, program. I've been interested in the professional development of the teachers, having been a career teacher bilingually, <laughs> bilingual career teacher for 25 years in a different district. And um, this is going to really encourage the uh, development of the of understanding of the uniqueness of each student in a way that the Career, the counselors might be able to, will be able to direct the student, help the student's family direct to uh, think of maybe a different college that they hadn't considered before because of a matching of the strong suit of that student with a strong department in, in that particular college. And I just love the uniqueness of getting to know each student by name and, and what they like to do and their interests. And it also works very well with the CTE program because there's so many advantages there to developing skills also. So thank you very much for showing this. And I think that uh, it's just another advancement in the, the um, excellence of this school district. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Eisendrath Rogers, and welcome. Hi, I just have a quick question about the study sessions. And I'm wondering if um, we're offering our students, each of them um, to make an exchange of names or how to um, get into a group. Um, do you have any uh, information for us about that? Yeah, so about the tutorial period. Um, 
Yeah, so essentially uh, the idea for this is that uh, each week uh, teachers would be able to list out um, what we'll be offering at our school uh, for that next week on that next Monday. And then there's a process that we'll go through where teachers are then going to be able to select students uh, to attend um, their session. So say I'm a math teacher and I need to work with these 12 students to reteach something, I can select those 12 students that I need. And say I'm an English teacher that wants to do a writing workshop because we're working on an essay and th these 15 students need help on that essay. I can schedule those students into my session. Uh, say there's a test coming up, I can do a, a test review session um, and schedule the students I absolutely know need to be in that session. Um, after you go through that process of selecting students, it then goes to the, the students themselves who then see all the things that are available, see whether they were selected by a teacher, and then they get to go in and pick what they would like to do. So it could be them saying, I really need to go make up this lab in biology. So they could select biology to do that. Or they could say, I really want to go see this guest speaker uh, that's going to be in the theater, and they can pick to do that. Um, and then by the end of the week, that all closes up, and they know where they're going to be that next Monday. And then that next Monday, um, they'll go to that spot. And so it's a flexible system, and we're, and we're going to use a tech, technology solution to allow our teachers to schedule that and our students to sign up, um, which will allow us to take attendance so we know where each person is supposed to be and are accountable they're accountable for where they're supposed to be during that period. Um, and it's a pretty cool system. And a lot of schools, maybe not a lot of schools do this across the country and it can be done really well and make a really big difference for students. Um, and the, the school where I was previously, we, we began doing it and it made a profound difference for our students and, and staff. Thank you. That is such an impressive program. And I'm sure the parents really appreciate that. So thanks. Yeah. Guys. Any other questions or comments from the board? Thank you very much, Mr. Dickens. And we're really excited about what we hear at San Luis Obispo High School. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, 6.03 employees of the year, Mr. Block. Good evening. Um, it's good to be in person to celebrate our employees of the year as teachers of the year tonight. Uh, that being said, we are in COVID, so we have some slight changes uh, to our uh, normal agenda tonight. But um, I'm new to my position this year. I've been a longtime elementary principal. Being new to a position, people often ask, how do you like your new job? Reading the applications and selecting these employees, doing the site visits, it's been inspiring the work that's going on in our district. It's fun to go out and, and uh, award the, or surprise the employees with the kind words that their colleagues have said about them. A little bit bored in public. And again, welcome to our employee of the year, uh, recognized candidates or uh, employees today as well, teacher of the year, their colleagues, uh, their family. So thank you for everybody for coming out and supporting them. Uh, that being said, when we, when we go through this process, we first start at the site level and their, their peers write in nomination forms or they, they, they self-select. Those forms for both employees of the year and teacher of the year come to the district office and we have a committee that then selects the district teacher of the year and then employee of the year in different classifications. So with that tonight, we're here to honor some fabulous teachers and employees of San Luis Coastal that have really gone, gone above and beyond in an extremely challenging year. So thrilled to be here tonight. So first one that we're gonna acknowledge tonight is Employee of the Year Certificated Specialist, and we have Lindsay De La Cruz, Student Support Services. On all of these applications, I'm going to be reading just a few highlights that were on the nomination form. So there is no doubt that Lindsay loves the work that she does. You can see it in everything that she does for our district and in her face when she is speaking with students. Lindsay has dedicated her expansive skill set and knowledge to the pursuit of improving the lives of children in our district. Lindsay played a vital role in making the Counseling Enhanced Program, CEP, the success that it has become given our students the chance to thrive with the necessary support. Uh, 
All right, next up we have- Dan, Dan before you go on, I wanna just acknowledge that we have Mr. Mayfield uh, here, Ms. Capilano here and Dr. Prater here to also do a presentation yeah, to we, the uh, winners. Yeah, we, we have the award, we have a little cowboy cookie prize for them and of course, Dr. Prater. So Employee of the Year Administration Management, David Rodriguez, Rodriguez Operations oh. Maintenance Supervisor. David possesses an uncanny ability to be immediately likable and warm. When David starts a project, he takes pride in every facet of the work. He not only studies and learns the intricacies of the work itself, but he takes time to get to know the people he is working with. One of his greatest strengths is building bridges and a rapport with the people from all walks of life. He is resourceful and creative in finding solutions and not only enjoys opportunities to learn and grow, but values the opportunities to help others around him be successful. All right, Employee of the Year, School Support, Sophia Torres, a Para 2, Para Educator 2 from Sinsheimer. All right, Sophia started in our summer school program and became a full-time paraeducator at Sensheimer. She immediately made a name for herself as a force of positive energy and an advocate for our students. Sophie spends every lunch, every recess and lunch out on the yard, playing with the students or chatting with one who is having a tough day. She is always smiling, upbeat, and takes her can-do attitude into every task she tackles. On top of being so positive, she is inclusive. She works hard to make sure all of our students are heard and seen on campus. All right, Employee of the Year Physical Support, Francisco Uribe, Senior Grounds Worker. Frank has not only proven that he has the work ethic and leadership skills that have made him success successful, but he is trusted and respected by his leadership team and colleagues alike. He is the embodiment of work ethic and tenacity, traits that have proven to be invaluable, especially over the last few years as so many new challenges presented themselves to our BGT department during the pandemic and return to in-person learning. Frank has cemented his reputation as a problem solver and leader in this organization. Thank you. All right, our last employee of the year, clerical, and our overall employee of the year is Deb Maxwell, Site Secretary at CL Smith. Hmm. The example that Deb has set and the incredible reputation she has established is respected throughout the district. She is passionate about her site, the families, and the students. Our students and their best interests are at the heart of everything Deb does, and there is nothing she is not willing to do in order to improve every facet of their time with us. The outpouring of respect and admiration for Deb Maxwell made her the undeniable choice for not only the clerical employee of the year, but she is also the district's choice for the overall employee of the year. Congratulations. All right, teachers of the year. So um, sites uh, put some nominations forward. We're going to acknowledge them before we do the San Luis Coastal Teacher of the Year. From Baywood, we have Teacher of the Year, Nandra Dallas. <laughs> Nandra Dallas exemplifies the very essence of student-focused teaching. From the moment she greets her class to seeing them off each day, 
Her students' well-being and growth are her top priority. Teacher of the Year nominee from Del Mar is Sarah David. Sarah is a highly innovative and experienced classroom practitioner. Staff note that she knows each of her students in depth from their strengths to their needs and is constantly thinking of new ways to make the educa educational plans work best for her students. Congratulations to Sarah. Teacher of the Year representative, Laguna Middle School is Erin Chimke. Erin is well respected on campus and sought after for her joyous personality. She dis distinguishes herself through exceptional contributions in effective instructional techniques. She establishes a productive classroom climate and rapport with students, as well as instilling a love of learning to be physically active. Congratulations. All right, Teacher of the Year nominee from Los Osos Middle School, Brooke Siegler. Again, these words are from the application from her peers. Brooke is a phenomenal educator who cares passionately for her students. She has organized an anti-bias book club this year for any teacher to participate in and leads them professionally. She positively impacts her students and our staff by holding us all to high ethical standards. Teacher of the Year Rep from Los Ranchos, Patty Aguilar. Patty personally ensures that every single one of her students shows growth and success, and her dedication is unparalleled. She generously gives of her time and resources to ensure that her team members have all they need to be successful. Congratulations, Patty. Our teacher representative of Teacher of the Year, Monarch Grove, is Nicole Butler. If you've spent a day at Monarch Grove, you know the name Nicole Butler. She is proactive, consistently stepping in to help all students and staff. Nicole carefully listens and considers the needs of students, families, and staff when making recommendations and support plans. Congratulations. <laughs> Monarch Grove couldn't decide, so we have another Teacher of the Year uh, representing Monarch Grove is Kelly Kirkpatrick. Kelly is well known for caring fearlessly about her students. She is always willing to tackle a challenge or help someone in need. Kelly is passionate, imaginative, and creative as a teacher and welcomes all students into her class to learn in exciting ways. Pacheco's Teacher of the Year nominee is Lisa Stevens. Lisa has been an anchor and an inspiration to the Pacheco staff. She was instrumental in facilitating a highly difficult redesign of the master schedule at Pacheco in order to, in order to ensure that as many students as possible have access to LLI and primary language interventions and support. All right, our Teacher of the Year nominee from Sinsheimer, Shelley Ferrari.
Shelly has created an atmosphere for the students that she serves that promotes growth in their learning and confidence in themselves as learners. She works hard to ensure that students' needs are met and they are supported academically, socially, and emotionally. San Luis Obispo High School's Teacher of the Year nominee, Mr. Jim Johnson. Jim is genuinely invested in his student success. He greets intera in and interacts with every single student in his class, following up with them on personal victories and challenges, asking them about their days, their struggles, and expressing genuine connection and care for everyone he works with. All right. Our final uh, Teacher of the Year nominee is Dave Furby from Morro Bay High School. Before I begin, Dave was not only the Morro Bay High School Teacher of the Year nominee, but also our San Luis Coastal District in, uh, Teacher of the Year. Dave is a very dedicated teacher and an integral part of the Morro Bay High School staff and community. He is always willing to do whatever it takes to help the students learn, and he is described as an inspiration to the staff. Dave loves the teaching and always strives to put the students first. He is thoughtful and intentional in his approach to his students. He works diligently to adjust and modify his instruction, instruction to best meet the needs of his students. He is willing to try new approaches to better reach them. They know that he cares and wants them to achieve and find success. His analytical and logical mind make him an outstanding math teacher and his empathy and dedication towards his students are what make him stand out as our teacher of the year. It's been my honor to present these employees and teachers of the year in a small community like San Luis Coastal. It's fun the way all the different uh, lives weave together and so many connections with the employees here today. Um, so again, congratulations and uh, we're proud of the work that you do. Um, the one thing I'd add is you listen to these, there's so many common themes, right, of what they do for their staff. So thank you all very much. Thank you. And we're we're going to take about a 10 minute, the board will take about a 10 minute break. So uh, we will resume at say six o'clock. Thank you.
6.03, I'm sorry, 7.01 correspondence. The board did receive correspondence from Lena Egan uh, regarding draft LCAP misses the mark by not adding high school counselors. Is there anybody from the public that is here that would like to address the board in public comment? Okay, seeing no one, um, I'm gonna go to Mrs. Dawson and see if there's anybody uh, on Zoom that would like to address us. Okay, seeing no one, I'm going to close public comment then. We'll move to item 8.01, business and budget update, Mr. Pinkerton. Yeah, so for the board to know, the uh, governor came out on Friday and gave the May revise, which is basically kind of a, a budget update. So after January, uh, the governor puts forward his budget and then the legislature meets, interests are shared. Um, and so Friday, the governor again announced um, to, to everyone that, that the state economy at this time is in a really good place. So kind of record surpluses, $97 billion dollars. Um, that he recognized and, and discussed and talked about and um, huge increases uh, in terms of LCFF for, for state funded districts. Um, there's going to be some one time dollars. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this at, during the budget presentation, uh, the impact for St. Louis Coastal, but wanted to share that information. So um, Katie Eklund, our Director of Fiscal Services, and I will be um, listening to the school services breakdown on Friday. So as that information comes in, I'll be sharing that with the board and we will, of course, update the budget um, accordingly as we uh, as we move forward. Um, the only other thing I could share for on the budget standpoint is just, uh, again, kudos to Erin Primer and her food service staff. Um, you know, because of the work that they're doing, we are seeing unbelievable numbers of kids eating lunch at and breakfast at our schools. And so because that's a program that makes money, right, by being reimbursed by the state and now free meals for all students, um, what we're seeing is this economies of scale growing. So we're able to increase the hours of our workers. We're able to bring in more people. Um, and so she's setting up a whole kind of program for next year, expanding hours at her sites. So really great for the workers you know, long-term, but also great for our kids because what this means is that the, the better they do, the, the more kids eat, the better food she's able to buy and serve. It's a win-win situation, right, for kids. Um, and, and so it's just, and we, we are so lucky to have Aaron Primer leading that charge, right? Somebody who actually has the vision to make it happen. Um, and so, uh, it's, I know it's been a rough year for her staff, like trying to just keep up, right, with the amount that they're serving a number of kids. And um, I mean, just growing dramatically each month, it seems like the more and more, the better the meals we serve, the more kids want to eat, it just is growing. So um, just again, kudos to her and her staff for all their hard work and dedication. We've increased hours dramatically. We're hiring more staff for next year. Um, and so this will be one thing that I think as a school district, um, we, will, we will be a light to the rest of the state of California about why school meals for all is such an important thing for kids. Um, and so again, I just wanted to give her kudos for that. Thank you. And before we go on to Ed Services, I, I did want to announce that um, both Dr. Prater and I received a letter from the County Office of Education. They concur with our positive certification for our budget. Um, they. They uh, give us kudos for our minimum reserves for economic uncertainties. Um, they say that our enrollment and average daily attendance is about 77,293.14. But since we're basic aid school district, of course, that, um, that doesn't affect our funding. And then also they mentioned our collective bargaining agreements, which uh, we will be talking about later. So um, I, I would just like to read the final the final sentence or the second to the last paragraph from Dr. Brescia. I compliment the board and staff for the timely and detailed budget documents, multi-year projections and narratives. So thanks to Mr. Pinkerton, thanks to Dr. Prater, thanks to Katie, thanks to all the people that are involved in that. Okay, uh, Ed Services 8.02, Mrs. Frost. Yes, just a couple of things to highlight this evening. First of all, for our summer experience, Jeff Martin and his team are doing a beautiful job putting together an amazing program for our students this summer. Just highlighting staffing, he has um, hired 74 
certificated staff members, principals, counselors, and teachers, and he's hired 82 classified staff members. We're talking wow. secretaries, library techs, counseling aides, instructional aides, and has interviewed over 250 candidates. So really has done a remarkable job to make sure that we are highly staffed with really capable and talented people for the district. We actually have 45% of our certificated staff this summer are existing San Luis Coastal teachers. So yeah, yeah, we're very, very excited about that. And then my second um, topic this evening. Yes. Um, yeah, go ahead. How many students? Are we at? Make sure you get yeah. Oh, we're sorry, about, that that's okay. We're about 2100. Wow. Yes. The, yes. the question, the question was about how many students? Yes, we have about 2100. Yeah, thank students. you. No, I was just repeating for, for the, the, thank you for the zoom. Thank, thank you. you. Yes. Yes. Very popular, very popular. And like I said earlier, um, Jeff Martin and his team have done an amazing job putting together this program. So very, very happy with, uh, with the direction and can't wait to see the kids in their seats. And then our second um, topic this evening, um, at almost every board meeting, I will bring board policy to the group. We do first reading, second reading. And we talk about some very important topics throughout the district. Today, I just wanna highlight one that we will be talking about. And of course, I'll tell you more when we get to the podium. But one of our policies this evening is suicide prevention. And I just wanna give you a couple of thoughts regarding preventing youth suicide. It's important to note that the rate of suicide for those ages 10 to 24 increased nearly 60% between 2007 and 2018. And that's from the CDC gave us that information. Suicide is preventable. Youth who are contemplating suicide typically give us warning signs. And we all know that teachers, staff members, staff across campuses have a lot of contact with our students and should know the signs to look for. In San Luis Coastal, we take SEL, we take counseling, we take therapeutic supports very seriously. We have school counselors across our schools. We have marriage and family therapists. We initiated care teams throughout our school several years ago. This is a group of highly trained counselors, school psychologists, program specialists, teachers who try to identify kids who are at risk. Our school psychologists are um, trained in suicide risk. We have partnerships with mental health agencies across San Luis Obispo. And we can't forget our family resource centers who really touch families in our community who might need this therapeutic support. So this is all in an effort to help our students to keep them safe and healthy. And again, um, important information to know about youth suicide. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll move to 8.03, Measure D update, Mr. Pinkerton. Yeah, just a couple of things for the board to know. Um, Gary Geary, uh, architect, Chris Bond and myself have been around to all of the uh, elementary schools over the past two weeks, looking at the uh, TK and K rooms. So as the board knows, there's uh, potential funding for TK um, expansion, facility grants through the state of California. So we're trying to get ahead of that um, and, and have plans for each site, kind of where these classes will be located, what the structural needs, facility needs would be, will, will be. Um, we have put forward uh, four grants um, applications so far um, and hope to increase that. As of now, they're saying that they're only gonna award one at a time but there will be different windows for when these come forward. So um, being that TK will start a year, you know, the expansion will start even more a year from now, um, it's, it's really imperative for us to have these plans ready to roll, get these conversations going so that um, should we get some of these fundings, this funding source, um, we can move forward with those. Thank you. Oh, I'm Mr. Mr. Pingard, I was curious about approximately what, the amount of money per the grant, grant money, what, what are they offering? They, they actually haven't put an amount per grant, oh. but it's more one per site. So okay. we strategically okay. put our first, um, our first, you know, applications in for those sites that would be the more expensive sites to modernize as we move forward. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Pinkerton. Uh, what, oh, I'm sorry. One more, I'm sorry. Um, so the other thing for the board to know, and I talked a little bit about this, I think, at a previous meeting. Um, when I did my, uh, when I did 
our LCAT meeting, Diane Frost and myself um, at Morro Bay High, there's some questions about, you know, the bond, why it's so slow and facilities and what's going on, you know, those types of things. So um, I had to ask Chris Bonham to go out and meet with the staff and walk the site, walk the construction. Um, so he did that this morning. I just talked to Mr. Scaldi, talked to Mr. Bond and said that was great. So he had about 10 staff members show up, walked through the facility um, and, and talked about construction timelines, what it takes, what goes into it right, um, shared the timeline that he received from the construction of the hotel that's in front, right? Because people look at the hotel and go, man, it's going up quickly. How, why are we so slow? And they're not. When in, when in actuality, when you look at the schedule, our, our schedule is actually going to end up being shorter than theirs when final completion. So it's those things where you look at a building being built and the initial framing, those types of things seems like it's going really fast and then it goes really slow after that. So it was just really nice, I think, for Chris to go out, meet with staff, talk about their needs. I think it was good for staff to see the faces behind the construction too, not just me at the district office, right? But the people that are doing this work and, um, and I think it was real positive. So, so much so that he's gonna actually have an after school um, offer as well to anybody who wants to walk after school and, and kind of take them through the facility as well. So just a you know, kind of one of those nice staff connection pieces that um, hopefully helps. Okay. Any comments or questions from the board? Right. Uh, 9.01, a public hearing of the 2022-2023 Local Control Accountability Plan, our LCAP. Mr. Mayfield, I believe that's you. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Mrs. Frost. I apologize. I think you and Mrs. Frost, perhaps. So during the public hearing portion, we just open the public hearing, allow any input yes. into it, and uh, then uh, close it down. And then we have a separate right. item where we can answer questions from the. Okay, so this is a this is a public hearing for the proposed 2022-2023 LCAP. Um, I will open the public hearing. Is there anybody here who would like to address the board? Seeing no one, Mrs. Dawson, would you let me know if there's anyone who would like to address the board on? this. No one, I'll close the public hearing for this. Thank you very much. Uh, 9.02, a public hearing for the proposed 2022-2023 budget. Mr. Pinkerton, do you have anything you'd like to add about this? Yeah, same thing. So this item is actually on the agenda for discussion action later. And of course, we'll take input at that time. But this is the actual public hearing of the proposed right. budget. Okay, so I'll open this uh, public hearing. Is there anybody from the public who is here that would like to address the board on this? And seeing none, I'll go to Mrs. Dawson. Mrs. Dawson, is there anybody who would like to address the board uh, on Zoom? Okay, seeing no one, I'll close the public hearing. Move on to item 10.01. 10.01 is a resolution 2121, I'm sorry, 2221-22, order of election, Dr. Prater. Thank you, Mr. Unker. Yes, this um, resolution is in response to our efforts at the county level to um, notify them that we are indeed moving towards a trustee area election for November 2022. And this is the necessary resolution that allows the board, sorry, allows the county to put place these particular trustee areas um, um, and their corresponding expiration um, dates on the ballot for November 2022. Um, Ms. Dawson, is there anybody from the public that would like to address the board on this? Okay, seeing no one. Um, board, is there anybody here who would like to discuss this item? Would someone like to make a motion to approve item to approve resolution 22-21-22, calling for an election on November 8th, 2022, to fill four vacancies on the Board of Trustees. I'll make the move. Okay, we have a motion by Ms. Dobler Drew. Who would like to second this, please? Mr. Buckman. Okay. Any further discussion from the board? Okay, seeing no one. Ms. Dobler Drew? Yes. Mr. Buckman? Yes. Dr. Eisendrath Rogers? Yes. Mrs. Frame? Yes. Mrs. Roger? Yes. 
Mrs. Sheffer? Yes. And I'm a yes, motion carries 7-0. Item 10.02, resolution 23-21-22, consolidation of election. And again, Dr. Prater? Yes, Mr. Unger, this resolution allows for our school district to avoid placing a single election um, for this upcoming um, uh, period. Um, so in order to consolidate the, the, uh, the election, we need to notify the county that um, we wish to put this on the general ballot in November, 2022, so that we do not absorb the full costs of that election. Thank you. Is there anybody from the public that would like to address us on this item? Mrs. Dawson? Okay, seeing no one, I'll bring it back to the board. Would someone like to make, would someone like to make a motion on this? Okay, moved by Mrs. Frame, second by Mrs. Roger. Hold on just a second, please. Is there any further discussion from the board? Okay, uh, Mrs. Sheffer? Yes. Mrs. Roger? Yes. Mrs. Frame? Yes. Dr. Eisendrath Rogers? Yes. Ms. Dobler Drew? Yes. Mr. Buckman? Yes. And I'm a yes. Motion carries 7 0. Uh, 11.01. These are action discussion items, dual enrollment, uh, course approvals. Mr. O'Connor? Thank you. I'm hoping that the presentation is here on the screen somewhere. I apologize. We'll get you, we'll get you some help. Yes, thank you so much. Here it comes. Good evening. Good to see all you guys. Thank you for your patience. Um, this evening, I'm here to uh, talk to you and present the dual enrollment um, CCAP course approval for San Luis Coastal for 22-23. Um, so that you're familiar, we often use the term dual enrollment. And I wanted just to define dual enrollment for you guys this evening briefly. Um, so we're talking about students in San Luis Coastal, uh, usually at the high school level, who would be enrolled in courses at the local community college, Cuesta, and they may be taking courses in our classes at San Luis High and Mora Bay High School. Um, and that would be part of what we would call concurrent enrollment as part of our CCAP agreement. There are also maybe students who might have the opportunity to take courses maybe over the summer or even in the evening, and that might be part of dual enrollment also. However, that's often defined as enrichment. This evening, we're focused on CCIEP approval with regard to our C, uh, mostly our CTE courses at each of our high schools. Um, here you uh, have in front of you a list of the courses that will be hopefully approved um, for dual enrollment purposes at San Luis Obispo High School. As you can see, many of these courses are related to our career technical education classes that are currently offered at San Luis High and the corresponding course that there's a course alignment um, for Cuesta Community College. At Morrow Bay High, this is a list of the courses that are currently approved and aligned with uh, the course offerings at Morrow Bay and hopefully with your approval for the dual enrollment process at Cuesta College. Leslie, do you mind? Yeah. Um, when I looked at these two slides, 
um, the thing that caught my eye was at San Luis High School, it's all CTE, which is great. Um, but at Morro Bay High School, there's two, I don't know what, to, academic mm -hmm. oriented classes. One is Spanish one and was the history of Western civilization. Correct. And I just wondered why Morro Bay, not mm -hmm. San Luis High? Yeah, it's a great question. So a lot of this is predicated on the credentialing of the teacher or the teachers for those specific courses and the opportunity for them to align with the requirements for Cuesta Community College. So in both of those instances at Morro Bay, there's the possibility and the uh, uh, approval for our credential teachers at both of those of those courses at Morro Bay to align that direction. Okay. So, I'm sorry. So is there some, some effort or some ability for us to inspire staff or help staff make a decision to yeah, I, I think perhaps part of the question may be how can we help support or encourage our staff to perhaps get that extra add on that it might be a master's degree, perhaps maybe in the specific subject matter, but it's a lot of times predicated on the faculty requirement at Cuesta to allow us to have that course on our high school campus. So is it I'm sorry, is it always a master? It's not always a master's degree in their specific subject area, um, but it is set by the faculty at Cuesta. Thank you. You're welcome. And then, Ms. Dobler Drew. Oh, I, I, I don't. Uh, Evelyn? Uh, Mr. O'Connor, and thank you so much for um, the presentation. Um, as we, uh, you know, looking at our slides, what are we, how do we move forward for our comprehensive high schools? And I think Mr. Buckman got a little bit to this in kind of building capacity at, you know, for that CTE kind of pathways. And the other thing is, is do we have at this, you know, in the future, some ability to tap into technology that, that the offering of pathways, I mean, I know some of you can't because it needs to be in person, but it doesn't matter the school that you're at that you could take advantage of, you know, that it's not dependent on your, your home school, but this is an opportunity that our district, just, to, just throwing that out. Yeah, it's a great question. So I think if I'm hearing the, the question, the way I would frame it would be, uh, would it be possible to have a schedule in place so that students could be enrolled at both campuses at perhaps the same time with a teacher of record, but receive their um, opportunity to interact with the curriculum, maybe on separate campuses, but yet receive that dual enrollment due to the qualification of the teacher? Uh, that would be ideal. Um, there are districts throughout the state that have, uh, back in the day, they would be called ROP centers. And the students would come from the various high schools to perhaps one central location, almost like a magnet, and they would have those opportunities there. But I think what you're describing is um, if we have a course offering at San Luis High with a teacher who is credentialed and authorized with Cuesta Community College, uh, but we don't have a like teacher at Morro Bay, would it ever be possible for the students at Morro Bay to be able to take advantage of that through technology? Um, feasibly, yes. The struggle would be based on the schedule. They're not like, so you've got one school in a trimester system, mm -hmm. one school in a semester system, one school's got a five period day and one school's got a six period day. So those could be inhibiting factors. Another uh, possibility could be that you might have the teacher teach at both sites and they could offer that similar course, but travel in between. Be a little bit more problematic, but could be possible. I'm sorry. Um, thank you for that. You're welcome. Actually, the other thing is, so this gets to Mr. Buckman, when we're trying to build, you know, capacity at our sites, I mean, our, you know, our teachers are, I mean, it's an, from it's my understanding, it's an extra level that we're requiring of them or certification or... It's actually not an extra level. It's the fact that they have the credentials from oh, a right. career technical education perspective, as I said, oh, right. except okay. by Cuesta, but there also has to be alignment with the course. And so there's those two pieces of oh, the puzzle. Okay. Um, okay. And I would commend like Liz Moore, our CTE TOSA to have worked with over the last few years, making sure that all these courses are dual enrolled. Can I ask about Mrs. Moore? Is yeah. there a plan in place to do somebody like her? hire to yeah. coordinate yeah we actually have that in place and uh we were also following up as an aside on our cte counselor today and so we were reviewing uh applicants again today for our cte counseling position but to answer your question yes Good. coming i'm sorry and, and kind of for those who might be watching um 
I believe during our uh, action consent agenda, when we talk about personnel um, actions, Mrs. Moore is retiring. Yes. So mm -hmm. I think that's what yeah. Ms. Dobler Drew is referring to. If I and if I could just tag now on on Evelyn's comments. Um, Thank you. So I understand that there might be a way to do technology or something to do the CTE classes across campuses, but is that also possible that someday we could do the academic ones as well? So if, if I yeah. wanted to enroll in Spanish one dual enrollment and I'm at San Luis High, maybe I could take it through uh, Morro Bay? Yeah, it's, it's conceivable that you okay. could absolutely do that. Ah, thanks. Yeah. Um, Mrs. Sheffer has a question. Thank you. Uh, and I, I just wanted to point out a little point of clarification because I really appreciate um, the number of classes we do have. And I just would like to remind folks that, you know, it wasn't too long ago that we had no opportunity like this at all. And so um, it, this is, this is in, the, in the history of what our district has done, these opportunities to work with Questa closely and develop these dual enrollment courses and the relationship we have is, I find it to be amazing for the length of time we've been doing this. Every year, it seems we have more and more of these courses available to our students. And, and it is up to the, um, up to Cuesta to determine what, what is needed by the San Luis Coastal High School teachers to be able to, to participate in this. And we have, a, we have more and more teachers meeting the qualifications and more and more opportunities, both CTE and academic, both of which I think are really important. And so I'm just excited to see this continuing to grow and grow. Thank you. Eve, did you have a question? No, I'm just waving my hand. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Um, so can you talk just a little bit about Pack Beach and, and what goes on there and why it's more difficult to have the dual enrollment classes there? Yeah, it's a great although, although important, and we know that that's something that I believe their student senators have shared with us. Yeah. Again, it goes back to the opportunity facilities, the availability of staff and the credentialing staff to be able to have those dual enrolled courses. It is something that Mr. Dowler as the principal of Pack Beach has talked about and is very much on his radar with regard to increasing those opportunities. Um, we have currently one course that we have uh, part of this agreement that we would like to move forward with, um, get focused. Um, it's, it's usually framed as get focused, stay focused. So it's really about that career uh, lens that students would have and the curriculum that would be offered at Pack Beach specifically. And uh, I think that's something that also is very valuable for the students. But I do know that that's one of our goals with regard to Pack Beach to increase the dual enrollment opportunities for the students there. Um, we've explored opportunities to think about maybe uh, utilizing some of our campuses, whether it be San Luis High or Moore Bay High, perhaps in the years to come where the students might be able to come over from Pack Beach and enroll in the classes while also attending classes at Pack Beach. That's something that we've talked about and explored also. Thank you. And um, yeah, yeah, I think uh, one of the things that it, I, I appreciate that and I'm glad to hear that because one of the things that we know when we go to the Pack Beach, gradu Pack Beach graduations is that I, I would say the majority of students are going to attend Cuesta. Mm -hmm. And so having that quest to connection, I think, is very important. Um, I'm not seeing anybody from the board right now. Uh, this, is, uh, this is an action item. Mrs. Dawson, is there anyone from the public that would like to address us on this item? Okay, seeing no one, I'll bring this back to the board for a motion. The motion by Mrs. Roger. Would someone like to second that? I'll second. Second by Mr. Buckman. Is there any further discussion from the board? Okay, Mrs. Roger? Yes. Mr. Buckman? Yes. Ms. Dobler Drew? Yes. Dr. Eisendrath Rogers? Yes. Mrs. Frame? Yes. Mrs. Sheffer? Yes. And I'm a yes. Motion carries 7 0. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you, Mr. O'Connor. Item 11.02, first reading of the 2022-2023 Local Control Accountability Plan. Now, I think Ms. Mrs. Frost and Mr. Mayfield. Yes. 
We were going to get our board item pulled up. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, perfect, perfect. Thank you very, very much. Good to be with you here again tonight talking about the LCAP. Just a little bit of background. Um, this is the first reading of our 22-23 LCAP, but we've come to you on a number of occasions over the course of the last four or five months. So I wanna give you just a couple of reminder details for the board and also for our public. This is year two of a three-year plan. So we're really looking at minor changes versus a major overhaul. We are concentrating on three groups of students throughout the district while we know that our action items do address, you know, concerns of kids outside these areas, but our English learners, our foster homeless youth, and our socioeconomically disadvantaged. Um, we have been gathering feedback all year long, but especially since January. I know you're aware of the surveys, the LCAP survey that we've put out. We also have the Youth Truth Survey. We use data from the California Healthy Kids Survey on the years that we have that. And we go out to groups and we talk to them. We ask them to fill out the survey, but we also take information back to um, include in our stakeholder feedback that they might not have put in the survey. We're talking about ELAC, DLAC, our student senate, our PTA leaders, our equity team, common ground um, task force, a number of groups across the district. So for the past several months, we have been gathering feedback. Um, I'd also like to remind the public and the board that we do have three focus areas in our LCAP, rigorous, relevant, and engaging instruction, Number two is multi-tiered academic support. And three is intentional culture of care. And I said, as I said early on, we really have worked with the board on a number of different occasions. We um, came to you just talk to, to talk about the types of feedback we were looking for and the groups we were going to. We went over an organizational chart that looked at that stakeholder feedback that talked about metrics, that looked at action items. And then last Thursday, uh, we met with the board to go into detail about the LCAP and answer your questions. Um, and then just to give you a, a, a little summary, if you talk about budget and this current LCAP, we've got LCAP supplemental is about 5.7 million and all other items add up to about 6.1 million. As you know, we are not an LCFF district. We are a district. When we see a focus area, we will put something in there as an action item that we are using to support our students. Oftentimes our LCAP goes over the 5.7 million requirement. So today I stand here with Rick Mayfield and we are happy to answer any questions that you might have about the LCAP. Okay, I'll open it up to the board and then I'll go to the public for comment. Uh, Mr. Buckman. Yep. Thank you. Um, my 5,057th question <laughs> on the LCAP. Um, I went back and looked at the slide presentation again. Mm -hmm. So it was, about slide eight, nine, it was um, focus three, I think. Um, and there were several places um, when you gathered all this great information and thank you, where it talked about um, the district would increase resources for struggling families. And then another time it was called outreach to all parents about resources. And, you know, the schools, for me, the schools are like the center of the communities and we take care of the kids and we do the best we, we can, right? Way above and beyond, which takes me to this question. Who's responsible for some of that stuff? Uh, you know, we go, we're feeding and we're, now we have family resource centers and um, is there some kind of joint effort um, in this community or in the county? I know CAP Slow exists and, you know, I don't think, uh, what the city does about homelessness and the county has some homeless policies, but do we ever all get together and sit down and go, hey. You know, I can think of at least one situation where we do sit down together and we kind of pool our resources okay. and talk about how we can help a specific family. There are what we call safe meetings mm -hmm. in oh, this okay. community. 
And that's when a, a student or a family um, has kind of exhausted the supports that we're able to provide on our school sites or in the district. We call a safe meeting. It's held in the community and you will have groups like um, the link, you will have probation services, you will have the women's shelter, you will have other community agencies come together and brainstorm how to help the child and the family. So that's one instance I can give you where outside agencies come together to support students. Another thing I would add, Mr. Buckman, is that uh, counselors are versed and have connections all over the community. And so typically when a principal uh, comes to a counselor and says, hey, we, this is the issue with this particular family, you know, a dozen phone calls are made uh, to all different agencies and there's a lot of uh, that kind of communication happening. In okay, I'm, I'm really glad to hear that. And I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, I sit on the school. So the, from the higher level, are there, is there any, you know, not asking specifically now, but you know, maybe there could be something at a higher level where there's a regular meeting between public education and other public agencies, just in general. But I'm so glad to hear about those two items. Thank you. Would I'm just going to jump in here. Would SARB uh, meetings also be kind of that collaborative meeting you're talking about? And SARB is School Attendance Review Board for those who are not, not completely familiar with all the acronyms that uh, mm -hmm. schools sometimes throw around. And, and in, in the initial stages, SARB is focused on supporting families and helping them to problem solve the issues around attendance. Okay. Other questions? Ms. Dobler Drew. <laughs> Regarding the third area of focus, the SEL curriculum, this is a new one since so many of our parents were in school and since I was even teaching up to 2018. I just want to ask about, can you make these programs better known, you know, about what the equity is about? And because that's becoming a term that's getting thrown around a lot and there's some fears being created about it. And I think maybe we don't need to have that as long as everybody, our parent um, community is aware of what it is and how it benefits everybody. What, and also the age level at which certain things are revealed um, or not revealed, taught is, is also another issue you know, K through, you know, let's just be uh, up front here. I'm thinking K through three is a, is a very um, controversial age to do certain things in that area. And so I just want to encourage transparency and a lot of communication with parents and not just say, well, if you don't want this, you can opt out of it but more be inclusive of those parents who want to opt out of it. And so that maybe they'll not opt, you know what I'm saying? So that there won't be a divide in the community in this particular area. Yeah, good points. I think uh, Steps to Respect is a curriculum that's been around a long time. I mean, we used, and that's would be considered today social emotional learning curriculum. Steps to um, respect. Steps to respect. And and one then, of them is second step. That would be the new iteration of steps to respect. So they redid the program and uh, renamed it uh, second step. And I would say many years ago, it had more of an anti-bullying kind of focus and accepting of other students and that kind of thing. And there have been uh, what would I say, you know, kind of new information that's uh, come about, new laws that have been passed that need to be incorporated into the education that we provide children. And then everything that, that we do, we always look at what's developmentally appropriate for that particular age bracket. So whether it be providing books uh, to students or curriculum, you know, we're looking at K to three as what's appropriate to teach to kids. At that well, level. I'm going to be bringing that up a little further down the line here. But right. as far as, so you say second step, okay, but the parents don't know how to know what that is. So we need to try to make it more known, don't you think? Because I know right now there's some, some buildup of um, mystery and going on about second step. Yes, thank you. Good points about just making sure that our, our families know the curriculum that we're providing in SEL. Thank you. And that they have access to that mm -hmm. and how it's being taught. Yes, definitely. Thank you. This is Fran. 
Um, thank you. And thank you again, Mrs. Frost and Mr. Um, Mayfield for answering my questions. Uh, quick, you know, one of the things that, you know, this is a, an enormous, impressive document. And one of the things that, um, if you could just briefly explain, one of the changes in from the prior year to this year is we're now having full-time counselors at our elementary sites. So I was just wondering if you could explain a little bit what that's going to look like and what our, you know, parents and you know, students can expect just in that area. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Janet Gould and Student Support Services will be coordinating, as she does now, the counselors across the district. She will be coordinating the new elementary counselors as well. Um, part of the LCAP includes three days this summer for all elementary counselors to come together and work on the scope of their new work next year, right? Full time at each site. Janet is looking at trauma, trauma informed instruction, going through training with the entire group on that, holding SSTs where you really dig down and find out the needs of the child and determine the next steps. Um, a number of things across counseling, but she will be working with them this summer. Um, okay, and so that leads into my uh, next question um, regarding, um, you know, some of the, the programs are, I mean, we've had for um, a while and um, you, this is year two of this particular um, LCAP cycle, but given um, the frame of COVID and, and how we're trying to look at services or things a little bit differently, how would we... Um, you know, what is, what is our EL program and specials? What does that look like different? Because we've seen it on every, you know, but what does it look like differently? Or, you know, is it, you know, I guess that would be my question. Yeah, and a, and a great question. Since the LCAP is focused on English learners as one mm -hmm. of the specific subgroups. Yeah. But um, in our multi-tiered system of support initiative, which is a big part of the LCAP right. uh, for this entire three-year cycle, um, English learners are uh, actively involved in that. You know, we collect data, uh, wh whichever students need support, uh, and English learners certainly would be in that, included in that group, uh, receive interventions and support. We also have in, um, EL specialists, English learner specialist teachers, at some FTE, full-time equivalent at each of our sites, uh, other than uh, teach elementary sites. And many of our Title I sites have over a full-time uh, employee or equivalent of a full-time employee at those sites providing specific services to uh, English learner students, especially levels one and two or, or students newer to the English language. Um, we're actively having discussions on how we can fold our EL services more into MTSS moving forward because that does need to be uh, an increased conversation of how exactly are we uh, getting to these students who um, who need the most help, our English learner students. Ms. Dobler Drew. Returning to the issue that I brought up about <clears throat> SEL and the parents being educated, there is an item, an action item with funds allocated to it to engage and educate the parents. And at, regarding all of these things, these three goal focuses, 73,200. So my question would be, how could an interested parent get involved if they're not one of the already chosen parent leaders? How, how can they be like active, actively pursue this perhaps? Yeah, they can actively reach out to their school site. At the elementary level, they can reach out to their classroom teacher and talk about the curriculum, ask questions about the curriculum in that classroom. And they can, you know, ask to review any curriculum that we are providing to our students. So all of those things are um, available to our families. What, what would the education for 73,200 include? What does that include? It says engage and educate parents regarding district academic and social emotional programs and parent education opportunities. Yeah, I'd, ha I'd have to review that item within the specific item within the LCAP, but I would say that there are uh, so many opportunities for parents to be involved and schools are actively reaching out to parents to be on the school site council, mm -hmm. the English learner advisory committee, participate in PTA uh, and, and mm -hmm. things like that. And at those meetings, curricular items are covered, 
uh, material goes out to parents all the time. Uh, anytime we do an adoption, uh, there's a public viewing of the materials. Uh, they're placed at sites, uh, electronic links nowadays. We're lucky to be able to do that. Electronic links are set out for parents to review those uh, materials. And then anytime a parent comes to a school office or the instructional services department and inquires about curriculum, it's made available to them. Okay, because I want them to know they can be more proactive than they have, they might know. Yeah, and, excellent and, point. and I think also uh, an appropriate place to go at the school site would be to talk to the count, the school principal. Correct. You know, and and I would certainly talk to to the classroom teacher, but I think I would also be talking to the principal as well. Um, so can I? Just yeah, jump go ahead. On? Well, actually, I, I I've got an item here first. Oh, I'm sorry. Excuse. Um, one of the things I was glad to see in the LCAP were, was the word acceleration. And, I, and I'm not sure that I remember seeing that before. Maybe I'm just more tuned into it, but I appreciate that word. Um, one of the questions I know that the board had, and I, and I would just ask that you take a second to uh, talk a little bit about it, is what does acceleration mean? Um, we talk about 5% um, increases in, in, uh, in, in our student achievement. Um, kind of what does 5% look like? And then some people will say, I think, you know, 5% doesn't seem like much, but then I've heard other people say, well, it's, it's like compound interest, you know, it's 5% this year plus 5% plus 5%. Mm -hmm. So could you talk about that a little bit and why that, why that's an appropriate number? Because sometimes I think that sounds a little low when we're looking at an achievement gap of, you know, right. 30 or 40%. Right. Great, great question. Uh, statisticians would tell you that 5% represents statistically significant growth over time, and that's what you want. For real learning to take place, you want growth over time. I would tell you also that within our interventions and all programs at school sites, we're pushing as hard as we can. Nobody is thinking about 5%. They're thinking of how far is the maximum I can get this student to go in terms of growth. Uh, we're tracking uh, our interventions and the students who participate in interventions uh, weekly and, uh, and to ensure that we're seeing the maximum growth among students. And I think the acceleration that we have seen this year is uh, remarkable uh, with students in, especially in reading uh, and writing and also in mathematics. Could you also talk for a minute, and you shared this with the board, but I think it's important for the public to hear this, talk about um, how our, our intervention teachers are, are plotting um, student achievement mm -hmm. and actually looking at, uh, you know, points points on a, on a graph, I guess, where we would expect to see a student achieve at grade level. Exactly, yeah. So progress monitoring is occurring weekly uh, by the, our MTSS team. Any kind of flatlining or not seeing the maximum progress that we would expect is addressed. Uh, we have uh, MTSS uh, TOSAs or teachers on special assignment uh, that would go out and meet with teams at sites. Uh, Jenny Appel does that very well. Um, and uh, Corey and Michelle as well in instructional services. And they'll go out and meet with uh, site teams and discuss students and what else can be done to maximize learning for that particular student. So it's, it's down to the student level of what kind of progress kids are making and how we can accelerate that. Just one more thing, just for anybody who's listening, MTSS means multi-tiered systems of support and it's a whole system of support that we use. Mr. Buckman? Yep. So. Um, first to, to Eve's um, question, um, recently I was able to attend a DLAC meeting and there were quite a few parents there, which was great, mm -hmm. but I'm wondering when we talk about PTA, ELAC, DLAC, um, parent leaders, all of those things, whether, we, whether it would increase participation if, for example, we're on Zoom right now, so people can actually attend this, they're home with their kids, maybe they're doing their chores, I don't know, uh, all the things I'm not getting done. Um, it, it, but it's increased the participation in our in our school board meetings tremendously. So I did not see Zoom at that DLAC meeting. And I'm just wondering whether there's, you know, the capability to, to help yeah. those groups if they want it, I guess. But yeah. that would seem to me that would really increase participation and the transparency. Yeah. Good point. And we're always looking for strategies to do just that. Okay. So I think there are advantages to and disadvantages to having folks uh, in person. And I think a hybrid is kind of the direction we're going to be heading. Our DLACs have all been conducted via Zoom uh, over the, since COVID hit, really. We were 
uh, trying to do one. There's one tomorrow night, as a matter of fact, at six o'clock. And we were going to do it in person, but because of the increase of cases that we've seen relatively mm -hmm. recently, we decided to switch to Zoom. Mm -hmm. uh, but my hope is mm -hmm. that we can have some kind of a hybrid model. Mm -hmm. uh, but even though we're in person and we can have you know food and, and mm -hmm. enjoy our community, okay. uh, we would also have uh, Zoom opportunities like uh, like we do here at the board meetings. Right. I, I, I'm just so excited. I, I kind of feel like it's the final democratization of everything we do because we can all attend. Going back to Chris's comments, um, I, I appreciate that the numerically significant number and that um, it that, that it um, if pursued, it, it might close the gap. Um, if our goal is 5%, I think that's interesting, but the report that I read during, in the LCAP at least, it looked like we were doing 2% um, each year and that, yeah, I think there's. I think there are different goals for different. We didn't. No, no, we didn't no, just put in a universal five. Yeah, but. yeah I think it was the result was two percent mm -hmm. increase, yeah. and it was pretty consistent in math and English. It was in the twos. Um, and and the other question I have is, if is the gap still about twenty twenty three percent? The the, the the achievement gap. It's something something. Yeah. Okay. So if we yeah. if we take the twenty percent and these students here improve, improve 5% and these students improve 5%. We're really not closing the gap and these guys may cap out someday. Mm -hmm. So I still have some real concerns about a 5% achievement goal when there are other, other districts in the state that are they're just nailing it. And what I heard was that AVID is just killing it. Um, in terms of closing the achievement gap. So um, I love the fact that we have a goal. I love that we're monitoring it. I love that every kid is, is being you know, tracked, but I'm also a little um, and, and just worried about having too low expectations. Yeah. So I just throwing that, I'm not looking for an answer. I'm sure. just offering my opinion. Thank you. Thank the you. only thing I would mention is yeah. that uh, we don't have all of our uh, end of the year data uh, right. in the report at this particular time. So, and we will update that before we turn it into the county. Thank you. Catherine, did you have your, your mic on? Oh. Um, but it's okay. I can, I can okay. go after it. No, and Evelyn, is... you, you go. Okay. <laughs> um, the question I was going to ask then was, um, I was curious about um, if we also track our accelerated learners and whether they are learning to their capacity, and if not, um, how we're you know, making uh, some, some kind of effort to help them to that next level. Yeah, great question. So multi-tiered system of support is for all of our learners. And so uh, one of the things we have within our uh, MTSS system is what we call win time, what I need time. Mm. So some students go out for interventions in small reading groups or writing groups, uh, some go out for math intervention, and then students that remain within the regular classroom, and that could be, not always, but it could be some of those uh, uh, students who are meeting or exceeding grade level standards, they get what they need at that particular time. And so, and teachers, are, I would say in our district, are versed at differentiating uh, in our curriculum, and the state standards are designed uh, for that vertical articulation to push students to to higher levels. So uh, what I would say is students get what they need. Excellent. Thank you for um, articulating that. Mrs. Shrine. Sorry about that. Thank you. Um, I think this this just the, the question came to mind as um, as you were talking, um, Mr. Mayville, as we're looking at um, you know these uh, these assessments, how I know we have district assessments and we have state assessments, and what is the correlation? If you know, if we're looking at um, what our students are doing on our, um, you know, our district assessments, what is the correlation to proficiency level? Do we have that? And I'm not at, I'm not a level of sophistication within our system to like, oh well, at our district assessments, you know, let's say in you know second grade, that potentially you know, we're looking at, uh, that, I mean, that's one level of, just curious. Yeah. I think Does that, that make sense to everybody? It, it, Mrs. It Rogers, you're looking at me like I'm, didn't make sense, sorry about that. 
It does make sense. And, okay. and that is part of the discussion is what are, what do our district assessments look like compared to state assessments, for example, and do they correlate to the, you know, what we would consider proficient on a district benchmark assessment with uh, what a state assessment would, would indicate. Uh, and I'd say over the, since COVID hit, it's been difficult. Yeah, no, uh, it's no. been assessment, but just by itself has been difficult. It was suspended for a year. Last year, there was a mixture of uh, many students opting out um, mm -hmm. because the state did not require the typical 95% mm -hmm. threshold of participation. Uh, and also some students were assessed via a distance learning, which mm -hmm. is really difficult to do. Uh, and then some students were in person. So. Uh, that comparison, I'd say, has been made more difficult. But this year, this year, since we've had kids back in person, uh, I think our benchmark assessments have been, you know, reliable, uh, and we have got a good picture of where students are at. And then when we get our end of the year results in, we'll be able to go through those and and kind of look at, you know, what what does what do all these results look like, and and does our progress monitoring show that students are moving up to proficiency in state assessments. Well, one thing, I mean, and again, when you when you're when you're talking, I my I began to think, do we have the ability to do a retro analysis? Uh, because of you know COVID has hit. Um, and as I've heard from districts around the state, there's a reset just because everybody's doing this and and there, but do we have a, a, a the ability to have a retro analysis of what our district assessments are doing and correlating, uh, you know, um, with you know proficiency because we have you know that prior benchmark. Um, and the other thing is, well, that's I, I want to ask. I'll ask something else later. But I really appreciate you know this this deep thought that's going in yeah. on monitoring our students. So thank you. Yes, thanks, Chris. Um, so you you mentioned the end of the year, and so I'm really excited to hear that i just do we have a regular agenda item where we take a look at the the, the, the achievement for the for the year as we did for the preparation of the lcap Tra traditionally i would say we've done that in the fall um okay. last year you know sbac told us however many years ago we're gonna have as soon as the students finish testing you'll have your results and that happened one year and then uh, since that time it's been delayed uh, and you'll remember this current school year, wow. it was January, I think, before we had certified data from uh, the state of California. So we're hoping that that changes. Uh, and certainly that would be a benchmark assessment data would be data that would come in front of the board yeah, just, uh, in the fall for end of the year. It's, a, it's unfortunate because here we are tonight having our first read on the budget. We're going to approve the LCAP. It'd be great to, to be able to you know help see and fund specific specific programs but it's the fall it's the fall uh, we it's great that we have the data that's yeah. just the exciting thing and i think I, I i think the important thing for me or one of the important things for me certainly about the assessments we're talking about in the district you know district benchmark assessments and things like that is are they informing instruction i think you know are, are they informing instruction and are they allowing teachers to have the kind of professional conversations that that they should be able to be having in order to accelerate student achievement and i think that's exactly. the, to me that's the important point yeah, agree. um dr prater did you have anything to say because otherwise i'm going to go well after you're done i'll go to the public <laughs> you can't talk about data not when you <laughs> yeah you know i have lots of opinions about the state testing right now. Um, very disappointed that we were one of, I think, the only district in the county that decided to assess our kids using the state data last year. And we only had half of our students participate in grades three through eight and then 11. Um, and then it took the state uh, six months to turn that data around. So the answer to it informing instruction is absolutely no. And the, you know, the pushback that we received from staff was legitimized by the fact that they couldn't give us the information before the school year began so we could actually make sense of it. And so I was very frustrated and disappointed in that. And this year, I'm hopeful that we'll get this information in, uh, in August so that we can provide the board with and more importantly, more importantly, provide our teachers and our sites with this 
learning information, which is really the under, underbelly of what it is you're talking about here is how do we know whether our low kids are still low and need extra support and our high kids are maybe dropped or have they progressed? And what do we do with that? So it gets to those four questions that Mr. Dickinson mentioned in the PLC framework today. And we intend to use that information. And we use, and, and the best way I can frame this is we have our fast bridge assessment protocol. We have common assessments that are not state testing, but common assessments that we're developing throughout the subject areas in secondary, which then could be used to inform instruction. And I, I see the state testing as validation. And uh, if we get that information in the early fall, we can actually use that with our staff to do something about it. And by the way, LCAP's a dynamic document. If we need to make adjustments, we will, according to that data and according to what we know our kids are, are learning and demonstrating knowledge for. So for me, uh, we're in a holding pattern until we finalize the end of the year assessments in FastBridge and in our common assessments. We then wait for the state testing data to return to us, hopefully in August, and then we can make sense of it. And that'll be a really rich conversation at the board level, probably in September, uh, maybe October. And, um, and I look forward to then doing some creative, hopefully dynamic statistical analysis of the kids that participate in our summer program mm -hmm. and see if they made headway uh, as we come out of summer and into the fall. I anticipate all the things that we're doing as a district will pay dividends in terms of perform student achievement and hopefully wellness uh, too. And so those are the things I'm looking at and, and by the way, are reflected in not just the LCAP, but in the board's priorities. And I'm proud of that. So I say, let's keep plugging along. This is good stuff. Okay, uh, Mrs. Roger. Yeah, I just wonder, Dr. Prater, so does that mean that we'll be assessing uh, summer school progress? And, and if so, what tools will we use to do that? And how will we get that information to classroom teachers for next year? Yeah, that, that's an advanced question on the rubric. Um, we're still working out the assessment protocols for summer. We've been working on it for several months. And the reason is, is we have our literacy standards for the elementary and, um, and we're really honing in on the third, sorry, the K through eight kiddos and really honing our focus on the kids that we know are far below where they need to be. So those kids will be monitoring what that assessment looks like right now. I assume it's gonna be a, the similar assessments we use in FastBridge during the course of the regular year to see if they've made any progress. So um, maybe a retro, uh, retro analysis that could be done on what they did in FastBridge and maybe the A reading um, can be reassessed to kids in the summer to see if they've made progress by the end of the summer. So I look forward to seeing how that works out, but I don't have a, an absolute answer for you just yet. So however it's, it's conducted, uh, would that assessment data then follow the student to their classroom teacher for the, for the next year? Absolutely. Yes, yeah. for sure. We're spending over a million dollars on summer to support our kids and not, and, and we're not taking this lightly. We fully intend to transfer that information to the classroom teachers, to the site principals and the classroom teachers that follow the kid. So, so they'll have fast bridge. They'll have S back. And then they'll have whatever the assess the end of summer assessment is in order to gauge where each student uh, is academically in terms of proficiency. Ideally. Mm -hmm. And that's if it all works out the way we hope. Mm -hmm. If we get another curveball from the state mm -hmm. and we can't get access to our, our state testing until October, November, December, then that's one key piece that again hobbles us, which is why we're so busy focusing on our local assessments that we do have control over. And again, state testing serves then as a validation tool to 
make sure that it correlates mm -hmm. to so that our, if our local assessments are saying that Joey is at grade level and the state testing comes back and says Joey's not at grade level, far below grade level, then we have a discrepancy and we need to address that. I don't anticipate that to be the case though. I think FastBridge, from what I've read and from what I've heard, um, does a nice job of calibrating to standard and grade level, but That's we will see. Yeah. I've heard a lot of things. I, I'm looking to, to evaluate it. We were on a roll. And I just want to say this, we were absolutely on a roll before COVID. Yes. Our district was making progress across all subgroups with the most significant progress being made among our most at-risk subgroups, okay? And so in other words, we were making, if you were to do projections, we were closing the achievement gap with our ELs, with our socioeconomically disadvantaged and foster homeless. We were making the gap smaller and smaller. And it wasn't because our high kids were decreasing achievement. They were actually making progress, but not at the same rate as the, as the, more, um, as the, the groups that struggle. Now, with that said, COVID threw us a major curveball. And the kids that were making higher rates of progress, those, those particular subgroups, were the ones dramatically impacted by COVID from what I can see, yeah. more so than the kids that were already achieving at high levels. So the reason we're spending such um, big money, and I'm proud to say this, on our summer model, and we've spent months and a couple of years actually developing the summer model, anticipating something like this would be needed. And I, I think what we're gonna see is um, the kids that, were greatly impacted, disproportionately impacted by, by COVID, will have a place in the summer, six weeks out of a seven week summer, full day, Monday through Friday, with structure, with focus, hopefully with a lot of fun um, for free and, and with meals. I mean, it's, it's something with transportation. It's all those things that we know are important and we're able to use those one-time monies to make that a reality. And um, this LCAP reflects what we primarily do throughout the year. But this summer model is, is something that is desperately needed and we're gonna enhance it each year, refine it each year, but to have over 2000 students, K-8 participating, we're gonna have more kids in some of our, in, in the elementary program than there are in the regular year at some of these schools. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to wrap your mind around, but um, but these are these are things coupled with the fact that the ELOP funding, oh, yeah. Ex extended learning opportunities yeah. program. Okay, extended learning opportunities program <laughs> ELOP. Um, that money is a lifesaver yeah, because it's they're talking about it ongoing. Okay. That money can be used to pay for our summer program. Oh, it is beyond hopeful for us. And now these kids can have school 11 months out of the year. I mean, it's a big deal. And for the parents that work, this is a absolute life-changing event. Well, the numbers, as you indicated, Dr. Prater, the numbers who signed up show us that. Yeah. So now my job is to make sure it's sustainable. And um, we found the, the funding formula to make it work. Um, that's not going to impact the regular school year. So for that, I'm just really grateful. I'm, I've gone on a tangent now, but those are my okay. thoughts. Oh, actually, Mrs. Frame first, oh, and then sure. Mr. Rockman. Okay. Um, I had a quick question, and it refers to um, a couple of questions um, that parents have asked, and I couldn't, I referred them to site principals, but this um, extended learning opportunity is such um, an incredible opportunity for our, you know, really for all students. But one of the things I was curious is, what does that model look like? Are students, you know, as Dr. Prater mentioned, you know, we want our students to, you know, have the structured learning, but fun. Are the students heterogeneously mixed? Are they, I mean, what does that kind of look like? You know, parents were asking and I said, call your principal. Yeah, they'll okay. absolutely be mixed in with the, with the regular population of students and provided before school care, after school care as well. As well. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think most of the programs go until about 6 p.m. So for those working parents who mm -hmm. want to take advantage of that, That's they'll fine. have that educational part during the day and still get you know, opportunities to do 
creative fun things uh, in the before and after uh, programs as well. So how long does that structured kind of learning time and then this great kind of enrichment, is it? Uh, well, there's during the year because we'll be able to offer extended learning opportunities during oh, the year okay, as well okay, as okay. Uh, in summer, not just, not okay, just okay. exclusive to summer. Okay. Um, but the models will look a little bit different and the hours of the day will be a little bit different between summer and the regular school year. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Buckman. Thanks, Chris. Um, so Dr. Prayer, thank you for that. At the beginning, you talked about um, the fact that we were doing great and I must have dropped it somehow. So and I, the data exists, the charts probably exist. So can I get can I get those from prior before the COVID charts and data? Or Chris, if you want to ask whether well, other board members say, want is, it, it is already that, exists. So. Is that available in board docs through our? Yeah, yeah. All of these have been presented to the board. If you actually look back into my evals, I shared in the final e summative email eval um, every year a comprehensive data report, um, and I'll be happy to share that with the board again, um, so you can see that. But you'll be able to see that our um, our school district uh, from 2014 to 2018, just before COVID hit, you were, you were able to see um, significant progress in, in, um, in particular in mathematics. We were seeing, we were two standard deviations beyond what m most students um, in our entire county were achieving. And without using the county comparisons, we were um, in, in uh, comparable districts. I will say to you, I have to go back and look at it, but we were, we were outperforming in both ELA and math. And I, I give that credit to the ISLA team and the work of our staff and the boards putting resources behind it. And, uh, and you know, it, it had had a lot to do with a, if you recall what it was like if you were a teacher in our, our district while we were making that shift in mathematics and making that shift in ELA there was a lot of struggle that led to those results and the struggle came from changing practice and changing how we looked at teaching and learning and it really was beginning to make a difference and um, my projections were if we kept at the same rate of change front that we did from 2014 to 2018 or 19, by 2025, had it not been for COVID, we would have seen um, a, a gap of about 15%. And what I will tell you, maybe, maybe even 12% is my calculation. But my problem is, is now I'm looking at it and I wonder if it's more like 40%. So, it's like three steps forward, two steps back. And so now we have to reevaluate, which is what we're doing now. And so, yeah. So um, this, is, this, is, this is the kind of conversation that I think school boards across the state should be having. Uh, I, I used to uh, be able, I used to prov provide a little, uh, tutorial on school boards and important things for school boards to the Cal Poly student teachers. And one of the things I advised the student teachers to do was to look at your district LCAP, because really your district LCAP is, is, is a statement of your district's values and goals along with their budget. Um, and clearly this conversation tonight demonstrates that. Um, Mrs. Dawson, I'd like to go to the public to see if there's anyone from the public that wants to address this. This is a first reading. Okay, seeing no one, let's go to 11.03. I'm assuming nobody has any more. 11.03, first reading of the proposed budget. Uh, Mr. Pinkerton, will you talk to us about how these two things dovetail? Uh, be happy to. Uh, I'm gonna give the board kind of a quick update in terms of May revise, and then Katie Eklund's gonna go through the budget presentation with the board and kind of give some, some basics. So. Um, Again, $120 million budget, potential next year. And so what the LCAP focused on was roughly $11 million of that. So it's actually a small portion of our overall budget, right? 
Um, that said, most of our budget is people. So the budget we're gonna, Katie's gonna talk to you about tonight, you know, 82% in terms of looking at uh, personnel costs for next year. We know that um, stirs and purrs rates, those types of things are all rising uh, and, and has caused the, you know, the overall personnel costs for the school districts um, across the state to go up dramatically. But let's start off with the May revise. So May revise, governor came out on Friday, kind of shared this huge surplus um, and it's interesting, right? Because we're right in the middle of a really economic turmoil. Stock market wavy, dropped significantly. Is that going to continue? Inflation up, Fed raising rates. So what's going to happen with the economy? And th the issue with that is what, you know, right now things look rosy, a lot of extra money. And so what the governor did um, kind of harkens back to Jerry Brown's days where when the economy was good, he gave a lot of one-time money. Right now, Jerry Brown, I will say though, gave districts a lot of control of that one time money. So that also LCFF kind of moved forward in those ways. The last few years, we've seen kind of that categorical come back in, right? And kind of tie in. So, um, you know, while the ELO funding is fantastic, the extended learning funding, it would also be nice if the district was just given those funds and the board was able to decide how those, those dollars were spent, right? Um, in terms of having the, there's a lot of controls on those, the, those dollars, right? It has to be um, from the three subgroups that we talked about in the LCAP, that is the focus. They have to sign up first before you offer it to other kids. So there's, you know, there's little nuances with some of these funding mechanisms um, that come through with the state versus just having total board control over how we spend those dollars. Okay, so that said, um, because the, the budget step, they are bringing up the base of the LCFF. So that's the amount of money that school districts get per student, the local control funding formula. You get a certain amount for TK to three, right? They give you a little extra for lower class size. Um, you get a little extra in ninth through 12th grade um, for that amount per student. Uh, and that's kind of for CTE funds, so extra programs for kids. So that's what state funded districts get. Um, and then on top of that, every EL economically disadvantaged student, foster homeless youth, they call it supplemental funds. So you get 20% of whatever that base amount is, okay? If you have concentration funds, so Santa Maria per se, if, if, if after your 55% of your kids, every kid over 55% of your kids, that's EL, foster homeless youth, economically disadvantaged, and, and again, they're all together. So if you're economic disadvantage and foster homeless youth, you, you only get one concentration fund, one supplemental amount, um, but that's 65% of that base amount. So they get the base amount and 65% of the base amount, concentration up, right? And so this was an equity focused funding formula for school districts across the state of California um, that came about under, under Governor Brown, um, because those kids need, there's more needs. They need more support and more infrastructure, those types of things. But, but what you're seeing now is, I mean, those with this huge increase in base, that's raising the supplemental amount, that's raising the concentration fund. So next year with this base, we're, the state funded districts around us are going to see huge increases, okay? On top of a COLA of 6.56%. So, Pretty dramatic. So that's a good thing. It's a good thing for education across the board, the state of California, right? Um, it's, a, it's a real positive thing for the school districts. Now, because of our state budget, the way it's established, um, it's, it, it's really rocky territory. So as the economy goes, the state budget goes. And so if the stock market falls, corporate income tax, personal income tax goes down. So um, that, that could have this really... Um, kind of roller coaster effect in terms of the budget. And so you could hear that in the governor's voice on Friday when he gave the, the, the May revise. You can hear it in what um, we're hearing from the state budget, um, legislative analyst office, those types of things, LAO. They're really worried about what could happen a year from now. So um, unfortunately for us, nothing towards retirement, stirs and purse in the May revise, right? Which was something we really would be nice to have. Um, nothing for basic aid school districts in terms of extra TK uh, funding, um, which is an ongoing mandate that, you know, we think is great to have all four-year-olds, um, you know, enrolled in school. And uh, that will be a built-in intervention for kids, right? To have every four-year-old have the opportunity to come to school a year early, right? Talk about great for parents. 
you know, free, free, um, you know, kind of preschool, right, through, through the school district. Um, and we have great TK teachers that will prepare kids and um, should escalate them. So, you know, when, when everyone, you know, talks about, you know, having these kids are coming through, that is like a built-in intervention for kids, right? Um, that would be a great thing. So we love it. It's great, but it'd be nice to get funded for it. So that's something as a school district, we are going to have to already this year, we have nine TK classes coming up, nine aides in those classes, right? You multiply that out next year, we should double those numbers. So we should have another nine TK classes. We should have another nine aid and aids in those classes. So you're, you're talking two and a half million dollars for that program to our school district. So we're going to have to take that in. We're going to have to just absorb that into our, our overall um, expenditures in our budget. Um, so, so those are kind of key things that didn't come out so far. And I honestly, I, I don't expect them to come out. I don't expect any change from now until, you know, they basically, in order to get this budget approved by the end of June, what the governor just gave us on Friday is probably what it's going to be. Little tweaks here and there, but that's probably what it's going to be. Um, there's some TK facility funding, which I talked earlier about that we will be going for, going after, right? We always go after whatever we can when it comes to grants or funding. Um, and the, the positive thing that I will tell the board is that we are going to get a, we should get a large one-time chunk of funds. So the governor basically said, hey, listen, we're not putting any money towards stirs and purrs, but, or TK funding, but we're going to give you a big chunk of money. So one-time funds, right? That should help you out. And you can apply it to stirs and purrs and these other, you know, keeping class sizes down, those types of things. So while that's great, and helps us for a year or two, those ongoing personnel costs, all it did was just push the problem another year or two away. So, you know, we, we were already, we're already facing a structural deficit. So we hired a lot of people with our COVID funding because there was a lot of need, a lot of intervention need academically with kids, a lot of um, socio-emotional issues with students. I mean, we didn't talk about it today, but you know, our principals, our teachers, as Diane and I went around the sites, like we're, we're doing all kinds of like records of students get, having behavior issues in elementary school. Like that's not a normal thing in San Luis Coastal. We brought in SEBs, right? These behavior aids for kids. Um, so when Dr. Prater talks about how the LCAP we, we turn on, you know, we, we make adjustments as the year goes on, we do that, right? We see issues, problems, we bring that to the board. Um, we try to solve those problems as we move forward. But from a budget standpoint, while all those programs are fantastic and nice, at the end of the day, we have to be able to pay our bills. Revenues have to meet expenditures. So um, Katie's gonna go through it, looks okay for next year, 22, 23. Um, we're gonna go to school services, uh, kind of find the information out on, on Friday to see what that one-time dollars are gonna be, you know, that's gonna help us push those problems out. Um, but we really have to start now, and we already have, so looking at open positions, doing it through attrition, right? We never want to have a layoff or have to have layoffs in the school district if you don't have to. Um, and so we will be purposeful in that as we move forward, right? While still trying to give our kids what they need. So um, you, still moving forward with intervention, still moving forward with counseling, those types of things. But um, slowly we'll have to look at things like, you know, other working conditions, class sizes, um, those types of things as we kind of move through the next few years. Um, because the, the, what happens is, is you're, it's one thing to say, you know, tell the, the county um, that we have enough money next year, we're going to pass it, but you have to give them two years out also, right? So that multi-year projection is where, where we can get caught up. So um, that's something Katie's been working with me on, um, and we'll continue to update the board, keep you abreast of what's going on, what, what changes we're making, how we're going to make that shift um, to get to where we need um, from a budget standpoint. Again, one-time funds. So Katie's, I'm gonna have Katie go through this. So these one-time dollars are, are gonna get spent down, right, as we move through. Um, and, and I think it's, you know, it's, it's something that, again, our kids needed through the pandemic. We received the funds, so um, we've utilized those as, as best we can. And we actually have another agenda item after this about COVID funding and kind of where we're at with those one-time resources as well. I, I'm wondering if you have any sense since all districts are affected by the increases in PERS and STIRS, mm -hmm. if there is continuing pressure being brought to bear on Governor Newsom to um, allocate some funding to that? 
We'll, we'll Between see. Between now and the budget adoption? I, I doubt it for this I, year. I do know. I, I, I don't know if it'll be successful, but I do know that CSBA is continuing to, oh, yeah. to make that a priority. Ongoing. I think, thank you. Because there's such a large COLA, because they're going to give this big influx of one time funds, it's kind of just release the liability, right? It, it's, hey, hey, look, look what we're doing. We're giving you all these money, right? So we're going to, you know, that, that should appease people through this year. It'll, It'll be when things turn a little bit and turn negative, right? That will, will be a positive, you know, potential um, issue as we move forward. And, but yeah, that's gonna be a, that'll never go away. I mean, again, PERS went up to 26.5%. It goes up to 28.3. I mean, it just keeps going up. It's, it, I mean, it's just, it's a lot, right? And, and again, our employees need to understand that it's not just salaries, it's not just the health benefits that the district provides. There's this huge part of their retirement, right? Which is a benefit of working for a public, you know, institution, you know, stirs and purrs, right? Teachers and, and our classified employees. Um, so it's 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 a great for them, but they have to realize it's it it takes a larger chunk of our budget, which you're going to see firsthand in a minute when Katie shows you the slides. You know, our benefits about five years ago actually overtook what we actually pay in classified salaries. Right, that's the, the cost of that. So it's, it's, it's pretty crazy when you, when you think of it that way. Um, so those are the kind of the key things with the May revise that I will tell you. Uh, again, we'll continue to watch it, see what happens, but it, it's kind of a weird thing, right? I'm gonna ask you to pass a, a, a budget on May 31st when the state hasn't passed a budget yet. And we really don't know what our property taxes are gonna be until November of next year. So it's, we do our best as we go through this process and make adjustments as we go, right? Um, and so, you know, this is, it, it really is kind of our best guess at this point of where things are gonna be, where we, where we think we're gonna land. Um, and just know that I'm, I'm already having the conversations with our cabinet group, with our principals today at our principal meeting about making strategic reductions as we can, right? Through attrition, as things unfold, um, while still, you know, looking at the needs, right? So we just did our AIT allocation. So these are our kind of AIT, AIT is a academic intervention teacher that works with students um, to tutor, you know, tutoring with reading and writing and math, those types of things. And so we looked at those fast bridge results. We broke that down by school site. What schools have the neediest amount of kids? They got the higher allocation. So we do that. And on top of that, those schools also have Title I funds. So they're able to you know, supplement even what the district is providing them, right? So it, it's, it's that process that I just want you to know, we go through that, we're looking at that throughout this process of, of attrition and, and trying to really meet kids' needs, um, you know, as, as we do this. So if it's okay, I'm gonna have Katie go through the presentation right now. So Katie, are you there? Yep, All I'm right. here. And I think Hello. she's gonna share her screen and we'll, we'll go through the slides. Oh, interesting. Hold on. Um, what do you see? Sorry, I can't see what you see. Do you just see the one slide? Because I have dual monitors. We see two slides, actually. But you can go through. We can see the first one. So as you go oh, through. Oh, you can. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. You're good? All right. Um, so here we go. Uh, as Ryan talked about, we're giving you our projected budget, but we're also giving you our estimated actuals and where we think we may end the year. Um, this is just an estimate, of course, um, as Ryan always says, an audit actuals, that's the final dollars. We'll know exactly where we ended the year. Um, when we go through and we close the books, we try to use all of our restricted dollar first. So we make sure our title money, we don't have too much carry over there. We're not allowed to have more than 15%. We'll make sure our LCAP is fully expended and that um, all the expenditures that we estimated would hit LCAP in the budget actually hit there. And we go through all of those restricted um, budgets, make sure they're fully um, expended to the best of our ability. And then we are left with our fund balance. Um, going into the budget year, we have um, projected a small deficit, which would Again, um, 
utilize some of our prior year fund balance, but this could change, like Ryan said, after the May revise, if we see um, any one-time funds or um, any other funding to help offset uh, this deficit. So Katie, this is Mark. Um, so when we're showing that projected deficit, are we still showing the 10% reserve? Yes. Okay, so that's on top of the 10% reserve or do we yeah. just take that, we take the 10% out and now there's a deficit. So I, Katie, if I can jump in. So we have our reserve, we have the funds that are in our, our savings account, right? This is the actual next year's budget. So if we have 27 million dollars in the bank right now this is just saying we're going to overspend next year by six hundred fifty-five thousand. so then we would have at the end of the year 26 million five hundred thousand okay. right yeah it for um and for budget when we're doing the budget it only looks at current year revenue and current year expenses and so there's no carryover we don't budget carryover there's no other um one-time dollars in there and so Again, like Ryan was saying, it would just reduce um, the the money that we carry over from prior year, which is part of our, it wouldn't go into our 10% reserve, it's outside of the reserve. Katie, Katie made this presentation prior to the May revise, right? Because we have to post it on the board agenda. So in terms of, you know, a lot, like I said, a lot of these things we're just finding out about now. Um, so Ryan and I talked with the county auditors about our property taxes. Um, because in April, our P2, um, again, they had a, a slight uh, decline to unitary. And so we had a lengthy discussion with them and they are projecting our secured tax to come in at 5%. Next year, unitary um, is set by the state. They, they don't have an estimate for that. They don't predict it will be as high as it was last year. They said there was a, outside of Diablo, there was another unitary pro property that was adjusted. And so that really affected um, our overall property taxes, which were down to um, a little over two and a half percent, I believe it was. Um, so we felt pretty confident going into it with a 3% increase, whoops, sorry. 3% um, increase for property taxes um, for next year. Again, it'll be revised in November if something else comes out that um, the unitary is not as dramatic of a decline as they have thought. Um, of course, we included the PG&E uh, funds. There's three more, three more years of funding left. Um, PG is supposed to go until 25-26. But PG&E has been paying, last year they paid us two payments. Um, we deferred one payment into this year and we'll continue to do that so we can stretch the funding out to 25, 26, even if we have to realize receiving multiple payments in one year, meaning uh, the actual revenue received would end in 24, 25. But for budget purposes, we'll reserve it to 25, 26. Um, COVID funds. So we are now done with all of our state COVID funds and are moving into what is called our ESSER 3 funds. Um, we had a plan that was approved by the board for ESSER 3 funds. All of those have now been reflected in the budget. Um, Ryan will go over those in a few minutes, what is left, so I'll leave that for him. Um, but those were included in the budget. State revenues, they were either based on um, 21, 22, if there was no updated um, GAN letters from the state, or uh, if we did have current apportionments, we um, adjusted accordingly. And special education revenue. Um, when I was building the budget, I budgeted special education flat. However, I knew we would have an increase there, and it's estimated that we'll get an increase um, in special education based on the COLA of 6.56%, which roughly would translate to $807 per ADA. Um, and the SELPA will figure out what that breaks down for our county um, specifically and send that out. And I will update the budget at that time. Mark has a question. Okay. Uh, Katie, I'm sorry, are you done with this slide? I sure. guess you have one more bullet. I can wait till I, you finish no, no, the last bullet. Go ahead, Mark. Okay, so given our given our experience last year and having to re 
you know, re benchmark from 3% down to what, what, I don't know, 2.5, Ryan, I can't mm -hmm. remember. Um, I'm just wondering whether we're possibly being too optimistic again. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm worried, for example, about inflation and increased, you know, increased money when it, more higher interest rates to get loans for homes. Um, that the home sales and therefore property taxes may go down. I'm worried about the drought um, driving down um, at least home sales. If I'm, we've we've seen a lot of increase on infill in both Morro Bay and San Luis Obispo, where they're you know they're urging people to put a second unit on their property and and um, allowing more homes. Um, and I just I'm I'm really afraid we're going to start seeing that go away. Um, I would be more concerned about out years for that. Uh, so a couple things. When we talk to the county, they're behind. So the county assessor's office assessing properties, having, you know, giving people their tax bill to pay for their home that was built a year ago. You know, Katie actually bought a home and got, got the bill a year later after she moved in, right, for her own home. So when we talk to them, they're behind in assessment. So that just means that there's more potential properties taxes flowing right from all these homes that are being built those types of things um the unitary drop tax dropped from seven million to five million so it was a it was a substantial drop two million dollars at some point it's going to go from over the next three years probably five to two okay okay so there'll always be some unitary tax when i talked with the assessors you know there's there's some unitary there's still pg e still here there's other you know utilities in the area those types of things so i would expect a three million dollar drop over the next three years will it be two million in one year will it be a million 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 how will that go we don't know how that will unfold right um you know we had a four percent increase last year and then two and a half so when we looked at three, we felt like it wasn't, you know, it's not, there's a balance when you create a budget to not be too conservative, right? So, but well, you, yet you don't want to be, it's safe. We could put 1%, right? We could do anything, but that would just show your, your deficit would grow by $3 million. Right. So it's that balance, right? So then are we going to, am I going to come to the board and say, hey, we need to cut $3 million right now because property taxes aren't going to come in we're estimating 1%. So, so you can see the problem with that, right? I can see a problem. So there's I a also, balance. And there is a balance. Yeah. And I'm yeah. just, you know, for me, last yeah. year, we, we budgeted 3%. The projections that we've done over the, you know, your, half, your projections actually. are are usually 3% forever. Mm -hmm. And it didn't work. And it's not because of you, obviously. Yeah. You, you're still paying your taxes. Yep. Um, <laughs> But, but it didn't work. And so I'm wondering now whether it's just wiser to start at 2.8 2 and, just, and just go forward because we've already, we've already been hit. And I just, I, and I understand. I but, mean, yeah. You know, we, when you do budgets, conservatives. You can. Can't, we can't print money. Agreed. Okay. But I, I don't, if I didn't think that 3% was a, a viable, you know, amount to bring forward that I wouldn't have brought it forward in terms of it. So again, we could make and, it 1%, right? I, we could I, be I, really conservative to make it 1%, but then that would mean that our budget would show that we're $3 million deficit, which I, I, means we would have to cut $3 million right now. And I get it. Right. And, and, and I, I understand that you're going to the 1% and it's 3 million, but if, but we, even went, two, if we went two tenths of a percent, it's not going to be $3 million. Right. It's going to match what it was true. Last one and year. a half million. Let's okay. say one and a half million. All right. I, so cutting one and a half million dollars right now. Well, that's why we have a reserve fund. It's a lot of staff. That's one time money. No, right. That's not why we have a reserve. So, so the reserve, I mean, the reserve is there and yes, we have built up. We have built up our reserves over the last few years because of the one time we've, we've actually had surpluses the last three of the past four years. Significant surpluses, right? That are, again, are going to help us get through this kind of transition period over the next few years. So I'm, I understand what you're saying. I get it. But, but the County Office of Education, when they look at our budget, they're not going to allow us to have massive deficits, you know, and show an ongoing deficit. So that's something in order for us to not be negative or, you know, have, you know, show negative budgets. That, that's, that's why we have to be cautious with 
kind of where we put things. Now, if this happens again, and we're at 2% again, after doing three, then I'm going to be right behind you and yeah. be a little bit more conservative in terms of our- And I just want you to understand, you have a much better calculator than I do. So I got to ask these questions. No, 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 but totally. I'm not, you know, I, but I think I, it's I, good for people to understand why we project and how this works and you know, well, kind of how it goes in. So it's, it's there. Your point is very well taken, but, Mr. But there's Bowman. a reason why Absolutely. we landed on 3%. Yeah. yeah. Because the 10, 12, 14 year average is 3%. Yes. Right? So we landed on that. We assessed that. Mm -hmm. We actually worked with, was it BICMAD or school services back when, back in the day when post, post recession, I remember that we, we did an analysis and we, well, we just looked at it recently for, with our teachers union, when we looked at the amount of raises we've given mm -hmm. and we looked at the actual help, what property taxes have gone up during that time. And it was literally an on average 3%. Yeah. But, but again, you have to look at today. Right, so we can look at the average of what it was in the past, but you really, based on the, the property values in our area, the rising property values, they're estimating 5%, right. maybe even six in terms of property. This is from the county office, yeah. assessor's office. You know, you guys just brought up an interesting point. You know, and, yeah. and, so, but, but I, and then Maryland has had a light on for a while, Mark, just know that. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, you just brought up an interesting point, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you talked about the salary increases. So was is this budget include a recognition of the four? Yes. Two, two? Yes. Okay, thanks. Oh, absolutely. Have to. I'm sorry, Meryl. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Uh, Mr. Pinkerton, in looking at the 3% property tax projection that we're using and, and understanding this is for one year, mm -hmm. this is this coming year. Yeah. Um, it, that seems to be um, an appropriate number to me, given that the assessor's office indicated that our secured property taxes would come in around 5%. Mm -hmm. So, and th that's the lion's share yes. of the money we received yes. for, for our operating costs. Mm -hmm. uh, the unitary taxes are a much lesser amount. So 3%, against that five, projected five, it seems very reasonable to me. Mm -hmm. But it didn't work last year. I'm sorry? I said, I, I don't think it worked last year. So I, I you know, I'm, 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 agreeing, I'm agreeing with the 3%, mm -hmm. okay? I understand it. I just feel like I have to ask the question because yeah. no matter what last year mm -hmm. estimate was by the county and all that, it still came in mm -hmm. a percentage sure. point low. So I just have to ask that question. You don't have to. Uh, Evelyn and then Eve. I think actually Eve was before me. Oh. Okay, Eve and then Evelyn. <laughs> okay. When it had us proposition uh, 13 figure into this, which says you can't raise uh, taxes by more than 2%, unless it's no construction or change of ownership. I mean, basically what you just said, that that's how it ties in. Well, so in terms of property values, so when somebody sells their house, so if, if I if, if I've lived here for 30 years and I I you know my assessed value is 100,000 and now I sell my home to somebody who moves in and their new assessed value is a million property taxes go up right the values go up. So how do how do we estimate three uh, percent increase the year? So the the assessor's office does. So the assessor's office nice. looks at the value of secured. So what houses are selling? How many houses are selling? Like they have all of that information, right? They know. They know every house that sells. They know what every house is worth. They know what the property taxes are. So they're able to do that. Now, what I will tell you is they're behind. So if anything, we might see a bump in terms of this because they're so behind in assessing all of these new homes that are being built around us. So it'll be an interesting, now will that last forever? No, right? So at some point things get built out and that stops, but I mean, think about the dramatic increases of home prices in our district over the past few years. And if they haven't caught up, I mean, we're seeing homes that were $700,000 a year ago, 1.2, right? So if that, those are things that, again, in light of Diablo Canyon closing, the loss of unitary tax, we're still seeing 3% increases in property tax. Okay. We were not expecting that when, when they first announced Diablo closing, right? That's been positive. Um, 
But again, this is a, for me, the budget, it's a personnel issue. I will tell you. Revenues are one part of it. It's a big part of it, but it is people, right? So we have to maintain an 85% personnel cost structure. So we're a little bit at 82 right now, right? But, but, but it jumps to 87 in our multi-year and gets even worse ongoing. So we have to, again, don't wait till it gets there. No, we're right now looking at it. What can we do now to make sure that that 82 doesn't turn to 87, right? Like that's my job is to make sure that we're making those adjustments as we, you know, as we speak, as we go through. So again, property taxes were three per two years ago, we estimated three, three and a half and they came in at four, right? So again, it is, it's, it's best guess, right? At that point, um, when things happen year after year, it's not a, you know, you have to, we're going to have to make those adjustments if that's the case. Absolutely. I totally get what you're, what Mr. Buckman's saying. Okay. Yeah, Evelyn? Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Pena. Two questions. One is, I'm sorry. Um, we're only on the first slide. I know. I, <laughs> I couldn't hear what the special ev uh, uh, education revenues were. I think Katie gave a percent, but I, I couldn't hear that number. Uh huh. Was yeah. what? 6.56% okay, so, okay. increase. Okay. And then the other thing is when you mentioned the 82% mm -hmm. you know, that we're sitting at and that it's going to jump up, is that 82% reflective of kind of all that one-time money that's coming? Yes. Okay. So when we take our personal right. revenues or our personal expenditures, we just look at the total revenues that we have in that school district, which are inflated by $8 million because of one-time funds, mm -hmm. right? These extra COLA dollars that are going through. So it's, Though it looks like it, it's actually a structural deficit long term, right? As we go out, so it's fine for next year. Looks great on paper, right? But that when those one time dollars go away. So when when you hear us just harp and harp about one time dollars, and they're great, but they don't solve ongoing personnel cost issues, right? As we move forward, so definitely something. And just a reminder that property tax revenues can go down if property values Absolutely. go down and people appeal their property taxes. Yes. So um, do you want to continue on? Katie, you're up. <laughs> Sorry for taking oh. over. <laughs> so here is a recap of our revenue. Again, property taxes are the, are the majority. I think we all realize that. Um, federal revenues, I just want to point that one out. It is um, at 9%, but that includes all the COVID funds. So typically um, that number is about 4%. We, we don't get a ton of federal revenue outside of the titles and some special education funding. So it's a little bit um, inflated, so to speak, because of our SR3 funds. So um, you can see our other LCFF is 4% and that's the held harmless for categoricals when we um, went to the LCFF. Um, we have local revenues, which is um, includes the Diablo Canyon payment and any local revenues from um, contracts with other districts or donations and things of that nature. Um, here's a graph talking about the LCFF versus um, property tax and the per, day, per ADA amount. Um, one thing, I just little fact to point out for just this year, I, I don't anticipate it will be like this next year, um, the gap will get bigger again, but Right now, an LCFX district is getting 10,540 per ADA, and we're receiving approximately 12,169. So that leaves about a $1,600 difference. Um, that is the closest it's ever been for this district as far back as the chart um, has gone since LCFF. Um, usually it's, it's a greater number anywhere from um, 1800 being the next uh, benchmark to about $2,500. But um, this is just reflective of the 6.5% COLA. Next year, the COLA is expected to be 3%. So mm -hmm. I would expect that number to grow again, um, or the difference between basic aid and LCFF land. Yeah, um, well, Katie, as I was looking at this chart and I looked at you know, that whole 10 years span, I'm glad you explained that because it looked like, you know, the difference between um, um, LCFF is kind of doubled 
from you know at the beginning mm -hmm. and we haven't doubled but so that's why so but we're anticipating that it's not going to you know close anymore that we will continue you're, yeah, you're we'll, see. That look. Okay. we'll see what happens okay yeah. thank you school districts that are lcff funded have seen some pretty big colas uh during covid we'll see if the state's able to maintain those um after uh all the one-time money goes away because the state receives those one-time monies as well and the economy is strong um, having, having a, a basic aid school district as your basis for your your revenues um is is much more stable than state funded right so i mean property values can drop as mr unger said right that can happen we saw three years where we had zero to negatives um when i first came on when i was working in personnel for the school district but i mean that you know they were talking three years ago about 10 percent cuts to the lcff base for for state funded districts right so i mean it can really vary based on the economy well and also if uh, uh, the Proposition 98, the LCFF numbers may stay up, but if the state doesn't have the revenue, then the state is going to, um, the state is, you know, going to, um, but, um, no, I, I was not going to say deficit spend, but they're going, they're, they're going to hold the revenue back from one year mm -hmm. to the next. I've, I've lost they're, the term. They're going to defer. They're, thank you. They're, they're going to, de they'll do deferrals, which exactly. we've seen. And deferrals yeah. are what they did in, you know, 2008, 2009. Yeah. And it's just a killer. For yep. districts. Yeah, I, I just would note that um, we've already moved on on the presentation, I guess, but I'm still on the graph, the LCFF versus um, she put it back up. Our, ourselves or community funded districts. And when you look at this graph, you can really see why we are considered a low wealth basic yes. aid district. Yeah. Katie, go ahead. Okay. Um, so some of the, moving on to the expenditures that were included in the budget, um, we included the 4% raise plus step and column um, for all of the salaries. The STIRS rates, they were um, increased to 19.10%, uh, and that is a 2.18 increase over um, 2021. PERS rate, we got a little bit of relief with um, the CalPERS board. It was supposed to be 26.1 and they um, approved at 25.37. So it was only an increase of 2.46% um, when we were looking at over 3%. Um, LCFF or LCAP supplemental funds, sorry, were budgeted at 5.7 million. Again, that's based on a 6.5% COLA. So, um, that percentage, uh, uh, the COLA drives the percentage in the formula of how much we set aside for supplemental services to students. And then um, for ESSER 3, all of the staffing and expenditures were budgeted accordingly to the ESSER 3 plan and the um, ELL plan also that is included in the budget for next year, expenditures were budgeted according to that plan. And here's a graph. Um, there's the 82% of salary and benefits that Ryan spoke to earlier. And um, employee benefits are 21% of expenditures without the um, STRS on behalf. We have books and supplies. Um, this is a slight drop going down to 5%. Uh, same with other operating services. Those have been um, higher in previous uh, last year and the year before due to all the COVID funding, but we've kind of shifted our COVID funding from doing HVACs into intervention uh, and staffing for that. So our capital outlay is at 1%, and that's typically 1% to 2% of our budget, depending on um, equipment replacements. And um, we have a couple questions, Katie. Okay, thanks. Katie, it's Meryl, and I, I just missed it, and I think you may have answered my question. Our sinking fund for technology, where would that be located on this pie chart? That would be, um, so for technology, that would be under books and supplies. Chromebooks are a supply now versus a capital outlay item. Okay, so thank cost. you. Thanks. Um, Katie, when I look at this, where do I look, Where do, which, which pie piece do I look at for staff development, professional development? 
Um, that would be in the 12% for services and other operating expenses. And, and personnel costs. That's what I was. Right. So when you're talking subs, you're talking, you know, um, teacher hourly, classified over those types of things. It's also a, a major personnel cost as well. So the more, the more professional development we do, which is great, mm -hmm. it makes the, it, it does make the salaries look a little higher. So, little. Yeah. but, but it does. Um, incidental. Yeah. Okay. That was no, it fine. is. That's my question. It's significant. Yeah, it is. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good, Kate. Um, and just to recap um, for the LCAP piece of the budget, um, it's our supplemental dollars are um, based on our fall CalPads count for the English learner, low uh, social economic, and homeless foster youth um, counts. Uh, again, it was budgeted at 5.7 million. Um, that number fluctuates a little bit because we'll get our October 1st count um, for 22 and we will update the LCFF calculator to make sure we're on track. It shouldn't change materially. And we track our entire L um, cap expenditures by uh, a, some dedicated discretionary codes. And this helps us to ensure that um, the three major or four major goal sections of the LCAP. Um, within that, all of the different um, pieces we uh, can, if, let's say, for example, we do professional development. We want to make sure that we're coding it to the correct area. So we would, and the correct goal. So we would use the discretionary code to track that. And it in, helps the county office ensure that we're spending the budget the way we wrote the plan. And, and kudos to Katie and her staff. This is the first year because of the requirement that you have to spend every penny of your LCAP that Katie and her staff have monitored it throughout the year and kept that spreadsheet rolling, sharing it with Diane, with Rick, with the cabinet team so they know where the money's at, how we're expending it um, to ensure that we spend those dollars. Yes, they yeah, like you said, would they change the requirements be, um, in starting this year that if you had carryover, you had to quantitatively and qualitatively explain why you were not able to meet some of your goals. So when Ryan brought the, um, in February, kind of the LCAP overview of where we were at, um, we looked at some of our goals and adjusted them accordingly to ensure that we could fully meet um, our supplemental requirement of LCAP. And then finally, we have the reserve um, explanation, and we have a 10% reserve. We have the 3% um, minimum reserve for economic uncertainty that is by statute. And then we have the 7% um, that the board would like in addition to total our 10% reserve. We have... Um, some other pieces of our fund balance that we assign to, uh, um, to various categories. We have adult ed. Uh, we are continuing to make $75,000 um, contributions to the adult ed program and whittling that uh, $328,000 down each year by $75,000. We have instructional materials realignment that we have set aside since LCFF went in effect. And as um, those funds are needed when we've exceeded lottery um, instructional material funds, uh, we can use some of those funds to offset any instructional materials that are needed. We have catastrophic leave for the employees that pay into uh, that fund. We have our lotteries. Then we always try to keep one year's worth of lottery. Um, and that has been done for years and years. And then we have um, the uh, 2.6 million to maintain academic programs. That is part of our uh, COVID plan. And that would be the funds that would help with our deficit spending from the first page of the $611,000. It would come out of that maintain academic programs for our deficit spending. So that is all I have. If anybody has any other questions. Yeah, I think we need to go to the public on this, Mrs. Oh, I'm sorry. Questions on other items. Katie, uh, on the SACS report. Uh-huh. 
shows a, a, a other state revenues and the first chart in this actually report, a 20% decline in state revenues. I'm having trouble understanding that given that there's, there's all kinds of money in the state level. So um, in 2021, we received a lot of COVID funds that were state COVID funds. And so they were reflected in state revenue. We have, um, and Ryan will show you a chart uh, shortly, but from there now we have moved to federal COVID funds, which are the ESSER funds. So uh -huh. our state, we we're not recognizing in the budget year state COVID funds. So they're they're dropping down to our normal, probably state funded programs. And our federal is slightly elevated because that's where all of our ESSER funds are for COVID. Okay. And in expenditures, in B expenditures, looks like books and supplies were planning to spend 26% less than the prior year. Yes, again, when you're looking at the 21-22, um, comparing it to budget, 21-22 has any one-time funds in it. It has carryover okay. deferred revenue from federal programs. So as we do the unaudited actuals, we get our carryovers and we get our deferred revenues and then at interim, any new fundings. And we're updating that 21-22 to budget throughout the year. And so it kind of grows in a sense. And then when we're doing a, our um, projected budget, we do not um, include any donations because those aren't guaranteed funds. Um, we don't have carryover or any one-time funding um, outside of what we, we may get from the May revise. But um, any grants that were one-time, we don't include those in the budget because they are not guaranteed each year. Okay. Thanks. Um, let me just. Okay. Thank you very much, Katie. Great job. It was really, really pretty easy to understand. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Mrs. Dawson, is there anybody from the public that would like to address us on this issue? Okay. Seeing none, I'm going to close. I'm going to close this one out. Um, instead of going on to 11.04, I need a break. So we're going to take a 10 minute break and then we'll come back to 11.04, our COVID uh, funding review. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Sure. So we'll.
Let's do this. This is great for him. Here we go. I get the fun job. Sure, go ahead. We can, Mr. Pinkerton, do you want to become, do you want to start? Do you want to become started? Yeah. <laughs> would, would you like to start, please? I will, absolutely. Mandy, are we ready? Yes, please. Yeah, so what I've pulled up for the board tonight, you know, part of ESSER funds is that I'm supposed to bring this back to the board, share the information. Um, I've attached a copy of our ELO plan to the support agenda item, a copy of our ESSER plan, um, the COVID fund summary page, right? And so as Katie was talking with the budget, there's some federal funds and some state funds, right? And so recognizing those in different years has caused this kind of weird thing that Mr. Buckman has picked up on in the SACS form, right? Where you see these massive, you know, state funding dropped by 30%. Well, that's because we got all the state funds last year, and now we're recognizing these federal ESSER funds the, the following year, right? So you'll see a big jump in federal funds then on that same SACS form. So um, I just wanted to, again, just share this with the board. There's nothing to approve tonight. It's just for me to share kind of where we're at with, with our COVID funding. Um, so as you can see, we've, we've spent through uh, the, the, um, the ELO funding plan, the IPI, there was really no plan for that, but that was in-person instruction, money that the district received because we brought students back to school in March of last year, right? So because of that, um, we received those funds. And then we have our federal funds, our ESSER plan, um, and that's what we're, you know, kind of going through the line and spending those dollars. Um, will we spend all of these dollars next year? We'll see. I, I would assume that since we spent six million this year, we're, we're probably going to spend about that, you know, next year as well. So that these these funds should pretty much be um, used up over the course of the next next fiscal year, which means that. Again, uh, we had wanted to have these programs and things go for three years. So this is causing me to have to look at potentially stopping some of these interventions, some of these um, you know, extra things that we brought forward with the district after next year, right? So beginning through that attrition process through looking at things. Um, and so this will be a conversation that we've talked about student results and achievement throughout the year and adjusting and doing those things. We're really gonna have to spend next year really deciding what are the what are the things that are having the biggest impact on kids because those are the things we're going to have to prioritize for the out year as we move forward right um and, and so those are just you know kind of key areas that i would i would let the board know and again i just wanted to update the board and let you kind of know where we're at with our, our overall covid funding plan questions does anybody have any questions about this is there anybody from the public that would like to address the board on this item? Okay. 11.05 uh, draft proposal for resolution calling for bond election, November, 2022. Mr. Pinkerton, you don't get to sit down. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Mr. Isom is here, John Isom from Isom Advisors. Uh, he's our, our advisor to our, our bond measures right in the past with measure um, D. Um, and, and is helping us with some work and surveying the surveying our constituents um, recently. And so, Mr. Isom, are you there? You might have to call him. I think Mandy's Mandy's letting him speak here. Is he on? No. Okay, well, he, he can listen as I speak and go through this while we'll I have him jump in. The, the point, Mr. Isom, the reason why I wanted him here is to really add, ask any, have the board ask any questions you might have about bond measures, how they work, you know, how there's, you know, any of those types of things. I can pretty much answer the most, but it's always nice to have an expert in the field um, to, to have my back as we, uh, as we answer questions about this. So, so let's just start off with Back in 2012, we did a facility master plan, right? At that time, um, we, we had updated our demographic study. We had moved forward with a bond measure, Measure D. So that was a bond measure that was specifically focused on our two comprehensive high schools. 
San Luis Obispo High School and Morro Bay High School, right? We did work throughout the school district though. We improved safety throughout the district and your phone communication system, right? For lockdown drills and fire drills and you know some of those types of things that, that are, were needed. Um, we painted some schools. We built a new multi-purpose room at Bishop's Peak. We did some other, yes. John is on the, uh, is ready to is, is participate in the meeting. Okay. So John, let me go through the history and then I'll have you, you jump in, okay? Okay. Um, so, so we again, the, the graciously our community passed Measure D, $177 million bond measure um, at the time. Um, over the past eight years, what I will tell you is, and after next year, when we complete all of these projects, we will have completed everything we said we would as we walked around and talked with staff and updated those co two comprehensive high schools. And they are, you know, all the projects so far that you've seen are beautiful. We're kind of finishing the, the last few buildings at both sites. Um, and, and we have two facilities that we could be majorly proud of, right? Um, beautiful high schools that are providing students as you, you know, Dr. Prater last night went to the Morro Bay High School movie, premiere student made films. Um, and, and let's credit the J-Wing. Credit the green screen room, right? The new computer lab for them to be able to do that. None of that would have been possible had the voters not passed Measure D. Um, and so, again, our kids, I just, the, the, you know, we were on the foundation meeting today and they were talking about they're having, um, they've opened up a junior kind of water polo and they got kids that are coming out for water polo and coming over to the slow high pool and even at Morro Bay that have never swim before. Just things that, like, experiences kids are able to have now because the voters passed Measure D, right? And entrusted us to do this. Now we took that 177 million and we turned it into 215, right? 215 million because we went after state grants and we went out for matching funds. Um, and, and we just pulled those resources, right? To do even more than what we could. And so, um, so that was great. And we're kind of nearing the end of that, those projects. Uh, we will have completed those projects, spent the Measure D funds. Um, initially, that bond measure was a $49 per 100,000. Um, because of the growth of, of house prices and the and new construction in the area, that actually has dropped from 49 to $39 per 100,000. And that is a bond measure that will continue to drop in the future as property values go up, as um, things unfold. So um, it, it, we will all be at an, another time, I'll be talking to the board potentially even about um, refinancing that bond possibly um, to even lower the overall cost to our property tax um, payers as well. So that's something we can consider um, later on. Doesn't bring more money to the school district, but could be something that would be an asset um, in terms of of, of taxpayers paying back Measure D. Um, so come to today, over the course of the past year, we've done a demographic study, we've updated that. Shows pretty much stable growth um, in terms of the school district overall. You know, there's a potential for growth, there's a potential for decline, but you know, kind of a modest, shows us maintaining our, our uh, the number of students in the school district over the next 10 years. Um, we also went out and did a facility master plan. So again, update prices and costs have changed dramatically since we did it you know back in 2012 13 when we did a facility master plan then so we wanted to update update that plan so went around to every single one of our school sites um went around to our our you know the district office our, our bg and t all of our elementary sites our two middle schools um our, our two high schools even it looked at all of the all of the projects and all of the um you know, potential costs of those, including infrastructure changes. Um, and so that came back, the board has approved that. That facility master plan is basically just giving the board information about what it would cost to modernize our school sites. That's all it does, right? So uh, that came back at the time of $570 million worth of potential work at our schools, okay, throughout our district. Um, hefty price tag and that just continues to go up over time that 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 will to me that's like a base number as we move forward right there is escalation built into it um into the that formula as you move forward um but the facility master plan is also not the board has not um signed off on what will, exactly will happen at every single school site right so what happened just like with measure d should the bond measure pass 
then the board would set priorities, would actually kind of lay out exactly what the dollars are going to be allocated, what projects, what the priorities would be for those um, in terms of, you know, as the process goes on, right? So, um, but, but the facility master plan is that it, it's a, a great insight for the board in terms of the overall cost of, of what modernization will be. And you saw our budget tonight. There's, it, it, it would take 570 years right, for us to pull a million dollars out of our budget each year to, to, to do these, these types of improvements. So basically what I'm telling you is that in the state of California, school districts modernize their facilities through local bond measures. That's just how it, that's how it works. Um, there's minimal state funding that comes up available sometimes. Um, we try to maximize that when it comes, but really this is the avenue, this is the way that school districts raise funds to, to do this type of work. Um, so that said, we have, we have needs now at our elementary sites in particular, as well as our two middle schools. Great needs. I, I, some, in some ways, when I walk around Los Osos Middle School, even Laguna, I feel like I'm walking slow high and more bay high back in 2012, right? There, it's just, it's time. Maybe not that bad, but they're, they're getting bad. We still have, you know, some urinal troughs in some of our bathrooms, right? Things like that that are mm -hmm. kind of ancient signs of, of old construction. Um, you know, Pacific Beach High School, you know, just, just different sites. There's a lot of needs, as you can see, and as, you, as I know you've seen from our facility master plan. So I asked John Isom to kind of put together what would a potential draft resolution look like for the board. That's what's attached to the agenda tonight. Um, I apologize at appendix. A, B, and C on Friday weren't attached. Um, did find out that you know that mistake was made, so we did it. We did put those in Monday. Again, we're not asking the board to approve a resolution tonight. This is simply an informative meeting, sharing the information about what it would look like. Um, and, and should the board be so inclined, I would bring that back to the board at a later date. Um, why don't I jump? Can I just ask? Yeah, go ahead. Thanks, thanks, Chris. Um, just one thing you mentioned just now, you said um, communities approve the bond and then come up with plans. Yes. And it, no. go ahead. Well, so the board, board will decide how bond dollars are spent. Right. And but right. sometimes is there a discussion ahead of? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Which, would, which a lot of times would be the facility master plan also. It's also the bond language, the types of projects that are, would, would move forward yeah. as well or changes to the facility master plan. Of course, yeah. yeah. Great, thanks. Oh, I have a, a question about, um, do, am I understanding from the language of the resolution that there would be some projects that are accomplished and then reimbursed from the bond at a later date? So you can do that as part of it. So if, if the district decided, um, hey, listen, we're gonna, we need to make some TK changes right now at Los Rancho School because they, they, you know, they, they need those changes to happen before next year. So part of this, and John can, can address as well, be, due to the language of the, of the bond, if we started spending those dollars, let's say we started this summer fixing up the TK room, mm -hmm. and then the bond passed in November, then the district could reimburse, could be reimbursed for those costs associated with it. But those projects have to be included in the bond language. And, but if the bond doesn't pass, then it just comes out of the general fund? Yes. Thanks. Which is why we won't be starting those projects until we <laughs> pass the bonds. Right? Yes. So, Mr. Ison, why don't you jump in and kind of tie into what I talked to the board about? Yeah, good evening, uh, members of the board and district administration and members of the community. John Isom of Isom Advisors. Uh, we've been financial advisor for well the better part of nine ten years now um, so what I wanted to do is just take a just a moment to talk to you about process and talk to you about how we got where we are why we have some funding this evening and then just touch briefly on some of the key elements of the resolution so as far as process goes similar to what we did you know for the the original uh, measure um, is that we assess the feasibility of a bond in your community. And you guys may remember, I shared a survey uh, of registered voters in the district where we wanted to statistically determine whether or not there was an appetite to support the district's continuing efforts to uh, have this you know, capital program continue. 
And at that time, I shared with you the good news, which was that voters in your district um, were willing to support a number of the projects, most of the projects really, uh, that they were willing to support the tax rates that were asked of them. In this case, we asked for $60, $49, $36. Uh, they were supportive actually of all of them. Uh, and then the fundamental question is, if the election were held today, would you vote yes to approve or no to disapprove a bond measure? That's the most important question. And at that time, the feedback that we got from the survey was yes. About 67% or two thirds of the voters said they would support a measure. Uh, keep in mind, our threshold here is 55%. So those are the kinds of cushions that we, we love to see. Um, in addition to that process, we suggest that the district uh, reach out to key stakeholders and have conversations with uh, community leaders, civic groups, et cetera, et cetera. John, John, uh, can I, hey, John, can I ask you a question? You sure can. So 67% um, is, that, that, that's a great number. Um, and actually that would, that would put us in the other category for bond approval, I believe. Um, sure. But uh, typically we would expect to see a fall off when, negative, when, when a negative campaign starts to be run, assuming there would be a negative campaign. Um, what's your experience for the drop off from the numbers, the, the pre, uh, the, the pre, uh, not election numbers, but the, the uh, introductory numbers to what happens later on during the election? Have any idea about that? You know, I, 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 I'm not going to give you a percent because there are just far too many variables, right? What's the level of potential opposition? What kind of voter demographic to begin with? You know, certain communities uh, are more prone to have the needle move than others. You know, frankly, if you're in the in Marin County in the Bay Area, it doesn't matter what opposition you have, you you would go from 78 to 77 percent or something like that. Uh, conversely, if you're up in the north part of the state, Shasta County, for example, uh, maybe a little bit of opposition would move the needle, you know, five percentage points. So, so I really hesitate to give you an answer, Chris, as far as, you know, how, how much things could move. Um, but I will tell you this, 67 percent is fantastic. That's what we like to see. If you remember the last measure in 2014, we achieved ultimately 72 percent or excuse me, 71 percent. Uh, success rate. So I think the 67, in case you're wondering why is it a little bit lower, I think it's just reflective a little bit of the times that we're in now, right? You're talking about COVID, you're talking about, you know, kind of a down economy, you're talking about a little more uncertainty um, going on. And that, in my opinion, would explain a little bit of the differential. John. Thank you, John. I'm sorry, Chris. Go ahead. Thanks. John, um, as long as we're here, um, you you said that 67% of the voters said yes, but we didn't, 60% of the voters questioned, right? Said yes. Sure. We didn't, we no, didn't question. Uh, of those that participated in the survey. Right. Four, and, and, and what we selected and what we chose to was 400 registered voters. That gives you a margin of error, plus or minus 4%. Of those 400 respondents, 67% of them, when asked the question, if you'd vote yes or no um, on an election said, yes, they would vote to support a bond measure. And so is 400 a number that, you, that is, is commonly used for Always. community our side? Always, Always. yeah. Okay. In fact, it's interesting, if you, if you ever look at USA Today, I don't know how many people read the paper anymore, but whenever I'm at a hotel, there's always a free USA Today. I always look at those little surveys <laughs> on the side. And those surveys, if you ever look at these surveys, and these are always a survey of the United States of America, and they'll say they surveyed a thousand some odd people. And I always thought that's impossible, 400 million Americans and a thousand is a statistically significant sample. And the answer is yes. So 400 for your much smaller uh, registered voters is, is exactly where we wanna be. Thank you. So John, go ahead. Um, should I continue? Yeah, go yes, for please. It. Okay, thank you. So yeah, so, so, so the culmination of this exercise of assessing the feasibility of a school improvement measure in the district is when you say those conversations with stakeholders, civic groups, community leaders, et cetera, look good. And my survey looks good. 
then what you do is you take that information, you take that feedback, and you create a resolution that reflects the will of the community. And that's what we've attempted to do here, is that we've created a survey, or excuse me, a resolution uh, that specifically through the feedback that we've been given through voters, uh, tells us the tax rate that we wanna ask for, in this case, about $49 per 100,000 of assessed value, uh, as reflected in, I think it's exhibit C. Um, the detailed project list, which is new under Prop 39, the 55% voter approval um, requires a detailed project list. So as, as Ryan mentioned before, the board will ultimately set priorities, but the board prior to a successful election will also provide a certain level of specificity on the types of projects that will be done, okay? We don't tell the voters we're gonna spend $22,000 on classroom you know, 1C at Pacific Beach High School. We, we, we don't get to that level of detail, but we do give them a lot of detail. We don't ask the voters to prioritize the projects, right? A lot of this is, is gonna come through the course of having an architect and a construction manager and additional conversations with the community. And it's going to take a lot of money, monies that you wouldn't otherwise commit unless you did have a successful bond measure. But we want to, again, provide the voters with a lot of detail, far more detail than, than what the law used to require, which is simply a 75 word paragraph, okay? That was the old rules. 75 words, you'd have to explain to voters how you were gonna spend uh, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in 75 words. Well, thankfully they changed that and there's a lot more transparency. So that too is a part of the resolution, the detailed project list. And that too is reflective of some of the feedback that we got through this feasibility study. Uh, the last element of the document that you have in front of you uh, that I'll at least touch on, the rest of it, in my opinion, is, is kind of legalese and directing the counties to do things on your behalf. But that's the 75-word ballot language. As I mentioned, that used to be the sole requirement of disclosure on how you would spend, in your case, hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, now that is just considered the summary text of the ballot measure. That is what will actually appear on the ballot itself. So if a voter does nothing except show up, you know, at the, at the, at the booth, um, they will see the 75 words. If they decide to do a bit more research, I think as many do, then in the sample ballot, they'll have the entirety of Appendix A, the 75 words plus the detailed project list, and they will also have the entirety of Exhibit C, which is that tax rate statement that explains how much in taxes what tax rate, how much interest and in principal is going to be expected in this case. Um, so that's, you know, I'll take a pause there, but that's, you know, uh, uh, in a nutshell, the process, why we are here. Uh, Questions from the board members. Don't go you know, I'll, I'll, close, I'll close what John said, which is, so again, from our sites and the reason why we're, coming forward to the board to ask you to potentially put this on the ballot, right? So it's not the board increasing taxes. It's the board allowing the voters in our district to decide if they want to increase taxes, right? Property taxes in this case, to, to do these things. And so for the board, as you know, we have major safety issues at our school sites from fencing to doors that can lock from the inside. I mean, we can go on and on about the needs, safety needs at our schools. Um, again, our two comprehensive high schools, great, right, with Measure D, but now the rest of the schools need those same improvements. Um, again, all of the things that are listed on, on, the, on Appendix A, from renovating restrooms to classrooms to roofs to ADA accessibility, I mean, you just go on and on about the needs, right, in the school district for this. So, um, we just felt, you know, Dr. Prater, myself, we, we, you know, we've talked about this with the board for a long time and just feel like it's our duty to bring this forward to you, right? So that we um, potentially can make these, uh, you know, bring this forward to the voters. Dr. Prater and I have been meeting with those key constituents, chamber, key leaders in our community, all very positive. What I would tell you, November 24, 
nothing really compete or 22, I should say, doesn't look like there's any competing measures hmm. this coming November. That said, it looks like there will be competing measures two years later from, from the conversations we had with those key, key groups. So it just seems like a, a, the right time, even though things are going on with the economy, those types of things, right, that are happening now, um, it, it's, it seems like it's the right time for us to bring this forward. I see. Eve, you have your light on? Yes. I wanted to ask about the addenda, addendums. Mm -hmm. Where are they located? I couldn't find them. The so ones that were added on Monday. Yeah, you should, it, they're on the dock now. We added them on Monday. So you should be able to pull I it up off the board docks. I couldn't find it. Um, here. If you go to the yeah. agenda item and then you just keep scrolling. So open it up. Open it up. 11. You have to. Yeah. Okay. This one. Yep. Right? Go ahead and open it up and then go down and then click on that. And then scroll, just start, yeah, just start scrolling oh. up. Just you, you went past it. There you go. Keep going down. The other way. Other way. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I'm oh, <laughs> sorry. Up, okay. up, down. So there's the appendix. Oh, okay. I see they were added on to yeah. the very document I was on. I was thinking I was going to click it. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, sorry. They're just part of the whole document. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Sure. Mark? Yeah. Thanks. So um, I, I'm just, great draft um i have or if another board member i have some just minor things that i might want to suggest um but i realize that this is pretty technical stuff yeah quite legal stuff so if i just submit those you guys would make a decision and then come back to the board and maybe say here are some changes that we made since the last yeah. time you saw it so i think is the that key better than bringing them up now it's, it's it, totally up to the board right but yes that's fine i think okay. the key for me would be to Again, this is John Isom as advisor to the board, right? What, right. what works in terms of language and resolution, right. those types of things. But yes, absolutely. If you'll send those to me, I'll, we can sit down, share them with John, make adjustments that are needed. And, and, and then just if it, it, and then you would bring it to us and say, here are some changes, right? So the, the next draft would maybe be, this was the original. I could share that in Friday notes, potentially, Friday notes. yes. Okay, because okay. I, you know, we wouldn't want somebody to change have input and not the rest of the board. Yeah. Right. Is that yeah. work for everybody? Sure. Well, I, yeah. And, and this is just a first discussion. I think this is a discussion to see whether the board has an interest in bringing this back. Yes. Yeah. Oh. Either the, at the, either the next, it would meeting, be the next board meeting, the next board meeting. Yes. And then we would, um, it would and be, a, it would be an action. Item. This Are you saying that it would be an action item on the 31st? Yes, is that an action. And, and the reason why, is because we don't have another board measure or board meeting until Ju June 21st, which is the day that we're supposed to turn this into the county county elections. So really, is something that should come to the board on the 31st. Okay. So Marilyn, did you have a question or? Okay. Catherine, do you have a question? Okay. Can you turn your mic on, please? I, I um, was just saying that I would like to see us proceed rather than um, wait. And uh, so, so I would move forward this uh, motion. If well, we're not, we're not, yeah, we're just uh, deciding. I think we'll take a look at the group and see whether we want to have this brought forward. Um, I think Ellen has a question. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, in response. In response to Mr. Buckman's suggestion about his or thoughts about his having suggestions, I think that's <clears throat> fine that he present those. But in Friday notes, Mr. Pinkerton, I would mm -hmm. appreciate not just saying these are suggestions, but from which particular trustees, so sure. we kind of know where we are, um, rather than you know this was brought forward, um, you know since we're not, we're it seems that we're deciding not to do some of that at this meeting, but I would prefer to have you know mr buckman suggested this mr shuffery suggested this and that kind of thing okay i yeah i i, I under i hear that ellen but i'm, I'm just kind of it, it doesn't make much difference but I'm, I'm not sure what difference it makes if we we know who made stuff but because if we were doing it at a meeting we would know if we were doing it well, right here and now we would know so and that's, i i i think I just, one for the sake of transparency i think that's why I think one of the things that um, we need to be cautious about 
as I'm thinking this through, is um, a possible violation of the Brown Act if we're going to be bringing this back and discussing it in more detail. And so I think we need to be very careful <coughs> how this is presented and what, what sort of feedback the board gets so it doesn't look like we're having a board meeting discussing this topic outside of uh, an agendized <laughs> board. Um, Mrs. Roger. Yeah, I, I'm concerned about the timing on this, mm -hmm. that it's it feels very um, rushed and is rushed by circumstances, I guess, beyond mm -hmm. our control if we want to go out now uh, or if we want to consider going out now. Um, will we, I mean, I'm looking at, at, at what we have here I don't have any quarrel with the, the verbiage of, of this resolution. Um, um, Mr. Isom has uh, got a long history of writing these. And um, I, it provides a lot of flexibility to the school board to make decisions in the future, should a, should a bond measure pass. But it just concerns me a little bit that we have to make a decision and a definite decision at the end of the month. I wonder if there is any board interest in meeting between now and then, you know, to, right. to discuss a bond issue, the whole, conceptually uh, to discuss a bond issue or uh, does the board feel like it's um, pretty clear in its own mind on where they want to go with the bond? So I guess to, to, in my mind to answer that question, I think what we need to talk about tonight, and we're only trying to get a consensus tonight, is mm -hmm. whether we want to bring this forward for action at the next meeting. That's all this discussion should be about, not, not, not necessarily the particular parts of it, but whether we want to bring this back is how I look at it. Um, to your eye, to, to your thought, we are having a special board meeting this coming Thursday, but it may be too late to agendize that. Uh, I think it probably is too late to agendize that, isn't it, Mandy? Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. Well, I, you know, picking up on what Marilyn's saying, um, I appreciate, Chris, that you're just saying whether we bring the concept forward, but realistically, we have to bring the wording forward to the next meeting. Um, so I'm not sure about the Brown Act. I'm not sure well, what the process is, but I'm kind of with Marilyn. actually, actually, we could add this to our agenda on June 6th. If that was the board's, if, if right. that was what the board's desires were. John, can you, for a bond measure, John, how does it have to be approved? Doesn't it have to be approved at a regular school board meeting? Uh, no, it doesn't. You can have a board meeting. It could be a regular school board meeting. The one unique characteristic about this particular measure, Prop 39 school bonds, um, that it does require two thirds vote of what they term the sitting board. Um, so if you, you know, it's not literally who's sitting in a chair, uh, but if there happens to be five board members, then you need four out of five, actually. If you have three board members, two out of three. If there's seven, you need five out of seven. So, so sometimes on those special board meetings, um, you know, if you have a couple of folks missing, even though you feel like, oh, I got a unanimous vote for those that were present, uh, it, it's not judged off of that. So that's the only thing to be mindful of on the sometimes the special board meetings is you might not have everyone there, but there's nothing that would prohibit you from, from approving it at a special board meeting. So, if I, and I, I guess Dr. Prater and maybe Ryan, um, it's sort of a, if, if that's, if this is what the board's desire is, what we could do, and I just want to see if this is a possibility, we could bring this back as a first reading at the next board meeting on the 31st and then have action on the 6th. Would that give you enough time to do what needs to be done? Yeah, that's fine. That could work. Is it that, was just hard because the, the June meeting was so late. It was like, you know, right. Yeah. No, I understand yeah. the June 21st meeting. It's kind of weird. So we would add this as a, as an action item on the sixth for the board during as either before or after the board retreat, probably after the board retreat. 
Is that, is that something that the board would want to entertain? It may be that the board doesn't require further discussion on it. That's just, that was just my thought. Um, mm -hmm. It just feels big mm -hmm. <laughs> and moving fast. But, you know, we have, in, in fairness, we have had a lot of discussion about it, you know, over time. So it's not a new concept. Um, I, I'm, I'm willing to, to see it at the end of this month. Um, I don't know what kinds of changes will be made to it, but okay. I guess more shall be revealed. Okay, Mrs. Frame. Yeah, I think I'm, um, you know, in listening to the discussion by um, fellow trustees, um, if, if people are weighing in or, um, you know, in Friday notes, then I'm, uh, uncomfortable in looking at the, um, the May date, um, the 31st, as, in, um, as the time that, that we would be um, voting on that. And part of that is because this is, um, you know, I want the public to have full confidence that we're doing our due diligence as, what, as we do. Um, so I would be more comfortable if people were going to kind of be weighing in it, you know, and we're, and, and we're not really having that um, as robust discussion now is putting it off on the retreat. And that's just, you know, my feeling right now. Or, okay, so to, just to clarify, so are you suggesting uh, essentially a first reading on the 31st and then action on the 6th? Well, I was kind or, of kind of uh, agreeing with, with Mrs. Um, Rogers' perspective okay. as I was, Which I was is, listening here, yes. Go for it on the 31st, Mark. No, no. Yeah, so no, 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 the, the no. sixth. I'm sorry, this so the sixth, right? Okay, so we we often um see items and I think even resolutions that you know so we could do a second time, but we just go ahead and we do it when we first see it. So, my thinking is if there are changes, um, just, and we see those the 31st and we are all in agreement, then we could still call for the vote the 31st. Is, am I wrong on that, Ms. Tryson? Oh, you're not. It could be a discussion slash action. Okay. And if uh, and if there's consensus after the discussion, you could you could. Okay. And so and if I may, if I may um, point out, there, there's essentially just four elements of uh, this resolution that as a board and as a district, you would have an opinion on. Um, uh, one of it is, is, is very technical. It's all the legalese. Uh, there really shouldn't be much bond counsel, the attorneys that, that certify these are tax exempt. Uh, they, they ensure that this meets the letter of the law. So, so there's this legalese section that, you know, maybe there's a technical word here and there, but for all intents and purposes, there's not much to, to, to provide input on. Um, so that's number one. Number two um, is the tax rate, right? Um, the tax rate right now that is being proposed and recommended is, is $49 per hundred thousand. Uh, the district could go for $60 per hundred thousand. Uh, I think the survey showed uh, support for that. Uh, certainly there's more support at a lower tax rate. And there's also something to be said about being sensitive to the feedback that you're getting from the community. But item number two that would be a discussion would just be, all right, is $49 the right tax rate? Uh, item number three, which is the most in depth, uh, would be the specific projects, you know, the detailed project list. Of course, you're highly reliant upon the district administration to provide you with what the master plan has and, and what kind of projects you actually have. Uh, but there's a fair amount of review, if you will, on the project list. And then the fourth thing is just the, the old fundamental. Do we go or do we not go? Right. I mean, do you do you do you put something in front of the voters uh, or not? Um, so those are the four things that I just want to give you some context about. You know, how big of a hill is this to climb? Um, I don't know that it's that big, but at the same token, I want you to be aware of the different areas uh, that should be your focus. Chris, may I? Um, yeah, but can, can, before you do, so 
Um, one suggestion, another suggestion I might have that, that could work, and I would need somebody who is more of an expert on parliamentary procedure on this, we could list it as an action item on the 31st. And then if the board decided to that they didn't want to take action that night, someone could make a motion to um, bring it back on the next meeting, mm -hmm. which would be the sixth. If the and, and that might be an easy way of, of getting through this. I, I don't. I don't. I, I think there could be little tweaks to the project list. Right. I, I don't see major revisions to what we've right. brought forward. Right. I mean, we're talking, I, you know, a word here or there type of thing that may, you know, may, might make things. But I would tell the board that this John Isom put this together. Right. So when we look at the tax rec state, the statement, what's going to go on the ballot. This is John's job. This is his, he advises the board. He, you know, this is what gets bond measures approved, right, with the public. So those are, you know, not to say that you might have some, board members might have some great ideas. Absolutely, right? And so it'd be good to hear those and we'll, I'll run those by John. But I would suspect that when I come back to you on the 31st, I'm going to give you a, a, you know, a potential bond measure language that Mr. Isom says, hey, that is, this, this, is, this meets the letter of the law. And I, th I think this is written the way it should be in terms of getting people to vote yes on, on this bond measure, right? So that's very different than <laughs> should we go out for a bond measure? Mm -hmm. Like those are two totally different yeah. things for the board to decide, you know, in terms of timing wise. Mark and, and so and I'm gonna go. go oh, oh, sorry, Marilyn, Marilyn, I'm sorry. Okay. So I'm gonna guess that I'm probably the only one that's got tweaks to this thing. I don't think they're gonna change that many voters. Um, I can back off of any suggestions, but I don't know whether yeah. that even changes the discussion about. There's a couple of things we discussed today that were great. I did, you know, well, that, okay. that were okay, right? So it's fine. But, but, Project list wise. But I, even if I, even if there's no tweaks from the board, it still feels kind of rushed. I don't know, you know, but uh, either way, Chris, we can bring it as an action consent, uh, action discussion action either way it doesn't matter we still have the opportunity to move it forward to yes. the six so yes. i'm I, I'll, I'll back off with any any tweaks mr Ison? Yep. yeah i i was just gonna say one other comment to, to to add to what you were saying and and that is when we craft the resolution there's three things that we're trying to keep in mind. One is, right, does it meet the legal requirements? And, and we use bond counsel uh, and their expertise to do that. Uh, number two, financially, does this, you know, accurately depict what we're looking to do? And number three is, what does our community want? What do they support? And, and the successful bond programs that I've worked on uh, the goal of this resolution is to give to the voters what they've told us that they're willing to support. So some of the language that you see there, you might go, well, why are we saying it that way? Or why is it? Because the voters want it that way, because the voters prioritize those projects or that language. So in many ways, as, as much as Mr. Pinkerton has given me a lot of credit here, um, it's not so much that I have such great ideas, um, but I'm good at interpreting and, and regurgitating, for lack of a better term, you know, what your unique voters would like to see and would like to have done. So, so keep that in mind too, as you're, as you're reviewing this resolution, discussing this resolution is, is what I've tried to do is, is craft something that, that the voters have told us through the survey and through other feedback uh, that they are willing to support, that they want to support, and the projects that they would like to see. Okay. Evelyn? Uh, thank you, Mr. Eisen. Uh, two questions. One is, you know, when uh, I just had a thought, and I know you already mentioned with the sample size, the 400, is that a random? Uh, how were random sample of voters randomized? How were those 400 chosen? Yes, random sample. One slight distinction is that we, we, we take all of your registered voters. Mm -hmm. Obviously, someone who has no phone number, gone. Mm -hmm. um, we also strip out all the people that have never voted, despite having had multiple opportunities. So if you've never voted and you've only been registered to vote for six or 12 months, 
I'm going to include you in that sample. If you've been wrote, registered to vote for six years, seven, eight, 10, 12, and you've never voted, with all due respect to that voter, their opinion means less to me okay, okay. than those that have a chance of voting or have a history of voting. So once you've stripped out the non-voters and those that don't have phone numbers, that becomes your sample. And from there, it's random sample generated by a computer. And when done right, and in this case, I would say that it has been, the demographics of that 400 sample is reflective of the demographics of your likely November voters. Mm -hmm. Same age group spread, same ethnicity, same gender, uh, same political party affiliation, right? The sample reflects the likely pool of voters for November of 2022. Okay, thank you. The other thing is, um, I think for me, I'm just, uh, I'm a little un um, uncomfortable with, and I would like to hear from um, Mrs. Sheffer, because when she was you know, when Mr. Buckman was talking about, you know, potential, um, you know, um, tweaks or for lack of a better word, and Mrs. Uh, Sheffer, she was talking about, you know, weighing in. That's, I think those are the things that make me uncomfortable in doing the May 31st. I mean, I understand that we can have a discussion and consider it, you know, discussion slash action item. And if we need to move it to the, um, 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 June, I think June 6th date. So I think I'm just a little confused about um, the process of other board members wanting to weigh in and what is that? So Ellen, are you interested in weighing in at this time? Yeah, I think my concern <laughs> primarily, Evelyn, is just um, uh, having that we're talking about <clears throat> the community's money and trust yeah. here. So I would want all these discussions to be as public as possible with, and you know, my concern about changes was things, you know, I've read the documents as is, and if I look at them again and they've been changed, I will definitely be curious about who brought the changes forward and, and why, because that seems to me to be part of this process here that's important and that the public understand um, why we might consider making some changes. Uh, if And I'm not saying I have any because I don't at this point, but if others do, then I'm curious to know, um, you know what they are and, and why, just as we have discussion items, we don't, to my knowledge, unless I'm, sadly mistaken, we don't typically have things occur. And then one trustee says, I'd like this item, I'd like this language changed before we bring it to a vote, you know, without the rest of the board being aware of the process. So I, and I don't want anyone to feel like there's been any sort of bait and switch or things haven't been transparent. Um, so, and, and we typically have board discussions at the discussion, you know, on agendized topics at the meeting. So that, that's, my, that's my only concern is just having the process be really transparent. So I'm, I'm going to suggest that we bring it back on the 31st for action. And um, that will give uh, board members two weeks to discuss things with Mr. Pinkerton, who can run things by Mr. Isom. It seems to me that, that, that the language itself is pretty pro forma and pretty necessary in order to pass legal muster. Um, if the board at that time decides that, that they are uncomfortable acting, the board can either, the board can make that decision at that time um, and, and go from there. And, and I, I think that, I guess I'm, I'm, swayed by the notion that really uh, what we're trying to do here is do we want to present something to the voters so that the voters can decide yeah. whether they want to see our schools in, uh, modernized and be made safer. Yep. So is the board good with that if we bring it back on the 31st and see where it goes? Okay, I think we have a decision. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Isom. Okay, thank you, John. Thanks, John. You bet. Thanks everybody. Okay. Uh,
11.06 proposed revisions to board policy 5141.4 child abuse preventing prevention and reporting this is a first reading mrs frost yes thank you very much again child abuse prevention and reporting it is a mandatory um, policy for us to review prevention curriculum recognition of signs so our staff are trained reporting procedures talks about curriculum and incorporating community resources as well i recommend this comes back for a second reading okay oh you know what oh my gosh we need to go back to I'm so sorry. We need to go back to 11.05. I did not call for public comment. Is there any public comment on 11.05, uh, the long discussion we had? Mrs. Dawson. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry. Um, so it's been recommended that we bring 11.06 back for us for a second reading. Does anybody have any comments on it at this point? I don't have any comments, but just for you know edification. The those colors, you know, the, the print mm -hmm. one. Could you just once again explain where they're coming from? Yes, Thank I you. can. Red means it came from gamut, gamut. Okay. right? So that's gamut. Green would be legal counsel. Blue would be director. And purple would be the subcommittee. Mm -hmm. And by the thank way, you. I think we should thank our subcommittee yes. for its hard work. <laughs> Is there anybody from the public that would like to address us on this, Mrs. Dawson? Okay. Next would be 11.07 proposed revisions to board policy 5141.52 suicide prevention. Again, this is the first reading. Yes, thank you. Again, I made some comments at the beginning of the meeting about the importance of suicide prevention. This is a mandatory um, board policy revision. Talks about prevention and instruction, staff development on suicide awareness, curriculum for students. Um, our subcommittee looked um, very closely at a positive school climate and information to families. And our counselors will help us out with that. I um, recommend a second reading. Mrs. Frame, do you have any questions? I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, I'm not seeing anybody on the from the board. Mrs. Dawson, is there anyone from the public? No? Okay. 50, uh, 11.08 proposed revisions to board policy 6162.6 use of copyrighted materials. Yes, yes. This is um, minor revisions to this, adding um, audio and vid uh, video as well as streaming services to the copyrighted materials that we would have board policy surrounding. Okay. Anybody from comments from the board? This is a first reading. We'll bring it back. Is there anybody from the public, Mrs. Dawson? Okay, great. Move on to the consent agenda. Please let me know if you'd like an item pulled. Uh, 12.01, approval of certificated and classified personnel items. 12.02, claim against the district, Lori French. 12.03, acceptance of donations. 12.04, approval of foreign exchange organizations. 12.05, approval of furniture and equipment requests. 12.06 review, I'm sorry, renew legal services contract with Dana Swaliver Kelly. 12.06. Okay. 12.07 uh, approval of minutes, May 3rd. 12.0, did I say 12.07? 12.07 approval of minutes, May 3rd. 12.08 approval of minutes, May 12th. And 12.09 annual renewal of services for super co op. A California USDA Foods Cooperative. Okay, would someone like to make a motion, please, for 12.01 to 12.05 and 12.07 to 12.09? Also moved. Moved, okay. Um, hold on, Mark. Okay, would someone like to second that? Seconded by Evelyn. Okay, um, Mark? Yeah, 12.06. Oh, um, wait, hold on. Let's. I'm sorry, you're doing let's the, do vote. the vote on this. Yes. Uh, Evelyn? Yes. Mrs. Dobler Yes. Dr. Eisenbeth Rogers? Yes. Mrs. Roger? Yes. Mrs. Sheffer? Yes. And I'm a yes. Those carry, Mr. Puckman, you pulled 12.06. Yeah, really. One quick question. Can somebody remind me what our contract, what these guys do with us? Um, in particular, with, with uh, DWK, we work with Deidre Sakai. Um, and she's kind of our expert on developer fees. 
Okay. So when we have a developer fee question that comes up, um, anything regarding developer fees, she's been a, a very good asset for us. Great, thanks. Can I um, she, move approval? Sorry. I was, I was just going to ask, hold on. Has she not also helped us develop our contracts for our lease leases backs? And she, our, she has, other yeah, buildings? just most Things. recently. I mean, that's kind of in the past now and has done that and moved forward. But recently, she's really been kind of that key developer fee person for us. But, okay, but yes, with contracts, construction contracts, she, she has assisted us as well. Okay. Um, I you. do need to go to the public first. Is there anybody from the public that wants to address us on this item? Okay. Thank you. Um, let's go. Um, I'll move approval, please. Okay. Hold on here. 12.06. Okay. Mr. Buckman. Yes. Mrs. Roger. Yes. Uh, Mrs. Sheffer. Yes. Uh, Mrs. Frame. Dr. Eisendrath Rogers. Yes. Ms. Dobler Drew. Yes. And I'm a yes. Motion carries uh, 7 0. Um, advanced agenda. Okay. Uh, reports by board members 14.01. Who has something they'd like to talk about? Mr. Buckman. Why not? Um, Thursday at the study session, I mentioned that I attended the ELAC at Hawthorne. I neglected to mention how. Wonderful it was to see um, parents who were leaders at their school who knew that were making motions and discussing th stuff in a in a in a wonderful manner, and it was just great to see that there are families like that um, at, at at every level in our district. Um, I also would like to just mention that this weekend I'm going to be going to Sacramento to represent the school boards in this county at the board delegate assembly, and I will be bringing home a report on that. And Chris, are you going to be? I am not. Chris is more, okay, because um, Chris is like a major bigwig in CSBA, and I'm just a delegate. But I, I will be up there this weekend. Okay. Who else? Ms. Frame. Yeah, I just wanted to give a um, huge shout out to, I know it's already mentioned, to um, Mrs. Peggy Flynn for her amazing and outstanding um, awards banquet for FFA. I just don't think I realize the depth and um, commitment and emotional attachment that these students really have to the program. And it was pretty astounding. And uh, I appreciate Mr. Unger for kind of pushing me to kind of attend that. So that was a great thing. And then um, I was able to attend, um, you know, Baywood Festival um, and tons of carnival, um, tons and tons of parents. And I had an um, opportunity to speak with um, the Filipino Association American. I was kind of invited to talk about kind of where we are in our educational kind of vision for our students and things and got a lot of positive feedback for that. So just thanks. Thank you. Anybody else? Well, Mr. Buckman um, mentioned, you know, ask if I was going to Sacramento for the CSBA delegate assembly and I'm not. And, uh, I would just say that on Saturday, there are two things going on that, that I would just bring to people's attention. First is that um, Marianne Britton is retiring from Del Mar Elementary School and the staff is having a, a, a going away party for her and my wife and I are going to stop by that. And then the second thing is, as I mentioned back several months ago, um, when we lost Carol Colley, who was the longtime be well beloved secretary at CL Smith School, um, her memorial services on Saturday. And so my wife and I will be attending that as well. And uh, she was a wonderful, a wonderful person and she will be greatly missed. If that's it, um, thank you all very much. And we will uh, board, there will be a special board meeting, a closed session meeting um, this coming Thursday at 8.30. Uh, and we're doing that at B3, is that correct? B3. And again, I've sent everybody an email reminder, please take a look at what was sent um, so that we can uh, try to come up with common themes for Dr. Prater's evaluation.